lab. We don't have very, very large lab spaces. The IRB approval process is starting again. So um, I'm, we're still waiting, my collaborator and I are still waiting for our IRB to be reapproved. We all had to file reapprovals for IRB for clinical research. It's all taking a very long time. Uh, NTU in Singapore, we are in phase two. So uh, now anyone who wants to go back to the campus or office can do that without any pre-approval. But uh, they encourage the students, especially the research students, to go back first. Mm. Uh, and the faculty members, if you don't have to go back, you don't you don't need to go back. Right. But students, because they've been staying at home without going to the labs for two months or more than two months, yeah, the progress has been delayed. So that's what they are doing. Yeah. So Hopkins for the fall is going to be on a hybrid system. We, uh, we have uh, actually quite a bit of classes in ME that will be on, um, will be in person. I know that all the design classes will be in person. Um, and a lot of the grad classes are in person too. The, the one with low occupancy will be in person. Um, I was, I, it's, it's a little surprising like that faculty would choose to do it in person. So that many, I, I mean, I guess people are just kind of sick of being in their homes. <clears throat> And Shu is here. <laughs> morning. Hello. Morning. 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 Uh, Ricky, how are you? Hello, Shu, how are you? Good, good. Texas is not so good, but <laughs> <where are> you? <laughs> you are always good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I am now a good cook. Oh. After is all this work. Is Yonga at home or office? Oh, no, in the department office. Wow. So is John. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> We're about uh, two thirds capacity, I would say, my group since June 3rd to kind of open things up for graduate students here. All kinds of protocols in terms of, you know, maintaining separation and masks and all that kind of stuff. But we've been pretty productive, I would say, over the last few months. It's not too bad. I see, yeah. Now yeah. our students are back to the labs, but uh, we usually don't go. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, it's optional for us. Oh, everybody. Hi, Julian. How are you? Hello, Julian. Hi. Well, maybe we should ask you Gong some uh, questions. Uh, before, the, before the webinar? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, uh, Vicky is uh, uh, can have an impromptu interview of Yung Guang Huang. Oh, kind of questions you you are afraid to ask before. Nice time. I have never been afraid of anything to ask Yung Huang. So <laughs> he's always been very forthright and open. So uh, I don't know how you're doing, Yung Huang. How how have you been weathering the the pandemic? It's it feel feel very depressed, very depressed. How you? Yeah, I miss all the interaction with the face to face interaction with the other people, with with yeah. colleagues, with friends. Now, you know, work can be productive, but all by yourself at home, it, it's pretty depressing. Yeah, I I agree with that. How are your um? How are your children doing? Where are they? Oh, uh, I have uh one son who attended New York University, NYU, then came back to uh, work in, in Chicago. Now he's working in Chicago. I have another one attending Northwestern, but he went to New York to work. So now I always have one son at home. Oh. Live trading. <laughs> yeah, that's great. 
Are, is he is he staying with you or is he? Uh... No, no, no way. He, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he came back to Chicago for a few weeks, then then found the job. Then immediately before he even started the job, before he even had his first paycheck, he moved to downtown. Uh, uh. Yeah, I know that my students are um, are. Are, 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 I don't know if the low spirits is the right way to say it, but they're, they're, they're feeling isolated and they've been more restrictive in their emotions, their movements than even I have been because we have little kids, so we have to be out or else they just destroy the house, right? So the, yeah, the students have not. So I, I took them for a hike um, a few weeks ago and that was like the first time they had been out since shutdown started mid-March. It's like, um, so I, I know the students are, are definitely suffering um, the effects of this pandemic. Yeah. And John and Jimmy, John and Jimmy who have lived in Champaign may know this, may appreciate this, but we try, you know, my wife Lily doesn't like to live in Champaign. And uh, when the pandemic hit, we uh, tried to ask our son Calvin to come back to live us in Glencoe in the suburb of Chicago. And, and he said that uh, uh, for him, living in Glencoe is like for my wife Lily to live in Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so he absolutely refused to come back to Glencoe. <laughs> so so if want, maybe I can ask a question, <clears throat> uh, if you don't mind. No, not uh, at all. I, I, uh, in your career, uh, my observation is you're extremely focused, very focused on you know the things that you want to uh, pursue, you want to really accomplish. Uh, from my point of view, this is one uh, major gift of your you know your character that makes you so successful. Oh, thank you. I'm not sure it's. it's a yeah, what, but go what ahead. Other, <laughs> can you name maybe uh, one or two other things that you feel, uh, this is for the benefit of the audience, for the young people, that you feel would be critical for, for the success in, in the research career? Oh, uh, I think it depends on, uh, 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 one, it depends on the stage of the career. I think when being young, it's very important to, to focus. But uh, once one getting older, and it's it's good to look at other things. And for me, right now, uh, besides doing research, another thing very important to me is to really promote the young young generation of researchers. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and I, I don't know whether you have heard the story of uh, that a researcher has three stages of career. A researcher has three stages of uh, uh, career in, in, in the research. So first is to do research himself or herself. In the second stage, one supervise others to do research. Uh, in the third stage, um, uh, uh, one uh, is in the way of other people's research. <laughs> So for me, uh, for me, the best way to stay away from the third stage is besides doing actual research myself, try to promote uh, the younger colleagues. This is why actually I, I serve, a, I do a lot of society serving, serving the editors, serving as the society board, and all this. This, this is a, way, a good way for me to, to stay away from third stage. Hey, Yung Gang, is your yeah. father watching this video today? I don't think so. It's too late for him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he can watch uh, in China. We have a uh, Weibo. Turn the yeah, yeah. video on Weibo. So yeah, I'll send I'm, you the link. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll send him. I'm sure he will watch later, but yeah. Yeah, I was thinking to invite your father as a panelist. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think that the uh, it's way over his bedtime, so, so <laughs> especially when the when the when the when the, uh, the when webinar over is over. That's way over his bedtime. Mm -hmm. Is he so, still so, writing paper? Yeah, he still has students and still writes papers. He slowed down a bit, quite a bit, but, but he still 
In fact, he's trying to finish a book. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah, and, Nine, and next 90, month he'll- 93 years old. 93 years old, 93 years old. <clears throat> So, uh, morning, everyone. Uh, morning. So, just curious, why you get the uh, interest in the blood vessel wave velocity, you know, pressure stuff? Oh, so when when do I get interested in this? Why? Why? What make oh, you? Oh, get oh, 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 This is really because of John, John Rogers, Professor John Rogers. Uh, he is trying. He has been uh, trying to develop flexible devices that can measure the blood pressure, but without using cuff. Without using cuff. To just you know, he can so people can can do it at home, can measure blood pressure continuously, and in that development, which I'm involved in, I find there are some 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 models used in medical industry, in medicine they need to be replaced or, or they are, may not be so accurate. So this motivates me to do to do to to, to do this work. I'm, I'm guilty. I, I pester uh, Young Gong with problems all the time. And, and then I try to convince him to help us find solutions. And you, usually he's successful at that. So it's <laughs> great, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm very convincing, you know? I'm very persistent. I pester him. <laughs> but this is, has really been a fun project in, in which you can see mechanics plays an, an important role to come up something, you know, more complicated, but also simpler in the end. For medicine, it's kind of a, a holy grail in a sense. Um, blood pressure is a very key physiological parameter that physicians use to make health assessments. Um, and that, that measurement either involves a cuff, as uh, Young Gong was uh, just mentioning, or if you're in intensive care in a hospital, they'll insert a pressure sensor directly into the artery. It's called an uh, arterial line, and, and you get a direct measurement. But that's a highly invasive approach. Uh, the blood pressure cuff is only providing intermittent uh, blood pressure values, and it doesn't work very well on pediatric or neonatal populations because their arms and their tissues are too fragile. You bru bruise the tissue if you use the cuff repeatedly. So there, a holy grail is to do continuous blood pressure monitoring um, non-invasively. And, and Young Gong has put together a, a really amazing, you know, mechanics and, and flu, fluid dynamics uh, solution to kind of uh, one, one way for, for accomplishing that kind of measurement. Okay, so we have like three minutes before the start of uh, the webinar. And I guess I'll go back to my original question, Young Gong. So um, the, um, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to remain engaged, uh, activities that, that, or, you know, like this EML webinar that you want to share and how you keep your students and yourself engaged um, during this time of social distancing? How, do you, how does one do research? Or do you have any advice on how to, to do research and be an academic in this time? You mean during this pandemic time? Yeah, during this pandemic time. Oh, the pandemic time, doesn't affect me that much in the sense that uh, in terms of research, because you know, uh, Zhang's group does all the experiments. So we could really enjoy his experiment data while at home do our modeling and simulation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from that point, uh, 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 the, the harder question should be to Zhang, <clears throat> for him to have a big lab, how to maintain that during this pandemic. But, but for me, it doesn't affect my, our research progress at all. It's just that uh, in the past we meet face to face. Now it's a video meet. Uh, I mean Zoom meeting, but but it doesn't slow down our research because we don't. At least I don't step into the lab yet. Yeah, that that's a, that's a question really should be answered by Chow. Yeah. Well, we, we had several different strategies. Northwestern opened up first week of June. And so since that time, it's kind of been a voluntary basis. Students can come back into the lab if they wish to do so. So I think we're about two thirds, three quarters capacity. Students come in uh, regularly. Others are kind of working from home in a hybrid mode. But before that, um, I offered the students the ability to take lab uh, apparatus home. And so there are certain kinds of experiments they can do in their home. And so I was promoting this idea of home labs, which is sort of an interesting concept. If you take a look at, uh, for example, Eric Betzig and Harold Hess, they developed a Nobel Prize winning microscopy technique in uh, Harold's uh, living room. 
So you can do certain things. And I try to sort of uh, motivate my students with those stories of home labs and Nobel Prize winning science being done outside of a traditional lab setting. And so a large fraction of the students set up labs in, in, in their home. Great. OK, so it's 10 o'clock. Shall we start? Um, I can't right. see. Please do. Okay, great. All right, everyone, uh, welcome to the EML webinar. Uh, today, our distinguished speaker is Professor Yong Gong Huang. Um, he is the Walter P. Murphy Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Mechanical Engineering and Material Science <laughs> Engineering at Northwestern uh, University. Um, Professor Yong Gong Huang is, uh, really needs no introductions, but I will try my best to uh, to, uh, to describe all of his many accomplishments. He has published uh, more than 500 journal papers, including uh, 10 in science and five in nature. It's really remarkable. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, of Engineering, and also Sciences, right, uh, Yang Gang? Uh, yes, thank that you. That was just this year. Um, he is a, a foreign member of the Academy of Europea, foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, member of the European Academy of Arts and Sciences. In terms of senior uh, medals or medals, uh, he's won just about every single one of them in uh, ASME, uh, ASCE, <clears throat> and um, in SES. Uh, more notably, uh, some, some notable uh, medals include the Praga Medal in the Society of Engineering Sciences in 2017, the Bizant Medal in AS, uh, American Society of Civil Engineering in 2018, and the Von Karma Medal uh, in the Society of uh, American Society of Civil Engineering in 2019, Drugger Medal, American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 2013, and then the Nandai Medal in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 2016. Um, so he doesn't just have courtesy appointments in these uh, different fields, he also has is well recognized and uh, for his excellence in all of these fields. Uh, Professor uh, Huang's uh, research interests um, include uh, mechanics of stretchable and uh, flexible electronics, um, and more recent and more recently applications to uh, to biomedical applications. So with that, I will pass uh, the, the the spotlight over to you, Yang. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, uh, thank you, Vicky, for hosting this, and also thank you, thanks Zhigong for inviting me. Uh, this work is um, together with my former postdoc Ying Ji Ma now on. Um, and professor at Tsinghua University and also uh, Professor John Rogers. Uh, let me first say why we, the background, why we do this work. And um, the left map shows the hypertension distribution in the world. And about 22%, over 1 billion people has this hypertension or people typically high blood pressure. You can see in this map here, uh, the red is over, I mean, the population over 35% having that. And even the best area uh, that you can see in the yellowish area, that's 20%, that's including the United States. This high blood pressure or hypertension can cause a lot of problem uh, to different parts of the human body, such as the brain, the blood, the eye, the heart, the kidney. And it's well recognized that hypertension is the most important preventable risk factor for premature death worldwide. In other words, if we can deal with hypertension well, then we may save a lot of life. We may really improve the quality of the people uh, people's life a lot. So the key idea here is that we really need to monitor people's blood pressure. Well, what do we do monitoring people's blood pressure? Usually you go to the doctor's hospital, they put a cuff on your arm, you can measure the blood pressure once or twice. And, but then you get a value. For example, uh, for me, it's typically 70, 110. It's a good number. However, blood pressure is far from a constant. 
if you look at this slide here for the same person, this is a 35 year old male, continuously monitoring his blood pressure over 24 hour period of time. And the red curve is the systolic pressure and the blue is uh, <clears throat> the diastolic pressure. So from this one, you can see that at the beginning, uh, this is 12 hours, this is new. And th this measurement start. You can see the blood pressure really goes up and down over the, the entire 24 hour time. For example, at lunch, you can see on the top left corner, there's a mark, that's a that's lunch time. You see some blood pressure rise. Then in the afternoon, but in the, uh, it goes down, but in the evening when you play sports, goes down again at dinner time, goes down and TV time. And at, at bedtime, when, you, when one sleeps, it's really low, but when it gets up. So when one says, what's the blood pressure? It really depends on what time you measure it. When you are happen to be in the hospital, when you measure it could be perfectly normal, but when you go home, you could really have something abnormal. Therefore, it's important for people who have heart problem, who have blood pressure problem, it's important to monitor that 24 seven over a con continuous monitoring over a period of time. So currently, what are the, mass what are the methods to monitor the blood pressure continuously? They call it uh, ambul ambulatory blood pressure monitor. Basically there are two. One is this cuff as shown in the picture on the left. For this cuff, when you cover this cuff, the cuff, cuff can apply pressure you know, every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes continuously. So this one, it's just like in the clinic, then you feel your, uh, your arm is really squeezed by the cuff and it reports a value of blood pressure. So this one, the issue is the measurement level to prevent this permanent damage to the tissue because the cuff really blocks the blood flow. You want to make sure that you should not do it too frequent. If you do too frequent, like every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes, it can cause damage to the tissue. But if you do it too infrequent, then it's really not continuous monitoring at all. In addition, even doing 30 minutes is still very inconvenient at night. You sleep, and every 30 minutes, this cuff gets on, and then the squeezing, you wake up. So another way of ambulatory or continuous blood mo monitoring is to do this invasive. They have the arterial line inserted into the vessel. And obviously with that line, it really limits one's motion, limits the daily life. It has also the increased the chance of the infection. Therefore, uh, people in medicine already has already proposed a way to use the so-called pulse wave velocity, PWV, pulse wave velocity, to measure the blood pressure. The idea is actually not to measure blood pressure directly, but to measure the pulse wave velocity. And this is the approach. Think of the human body and you put two sensors with a distance L, with a distance L. Then once the heart beats, the pulse width generated, you can measure the time when the pulse reach, reach the first sensor, which the second sensor, you can find the time difference. So the picture on the right illustrate the time dif difference when the pulse wave reaches those two sensors. You call that the time difference delta t. Of course, you know the lens L between the two. And this way, you can monitor the pulse wave velocity continuously. So this is a very elegant measurement. You can measure the pulse wave velocity. Uh, but the question is, how is that related to blood pressure? The pulse wave velocity is certainly not blood pressure. How is that related to blood pressure? So this goes on to the second part of my talk. 
uh, this uh, person, MK, developed a very useful equation. So let me illustrate his approach. Think of a blood vessel marked by the blue color on the right. And blood being red, marked by the red color, is floating in the vessel. So once the heart beats, and it really produces a bulge, which propagates to the other end. Okay. And uh, this is really a wave propagation problem and as a classical solution. In this classical solution obtained by M MK, it relates, you can see this only equation on the left side, it relates the pulse wave velocity to the Young's modulus of the blood vessel to the thickness H of the blood vessel, and also its radius R, as well as the density of the blood, of the fluid, blood. So in this equation here, they can relate the pulse wave velocity to three properties of the vessel, Young's model, thickness and radius of the vessel, as well as the mass density of the blood. Of course, there are some assumptions made here, which I will not focus right now. I will emphasize that later. But even though this is a very nice equation, I have to emphasize all this quantity. There are two challenges. Number one, this is still not an equation related to blood pressure yet. It's Young's modulus, thickness, radius, and density. It's not blood pressure. Second of all, all those quantities except the density of the blood, all the other three are very difficult to measure. Because you cannot imagine a patient in, your, uh, in the clinic that you, you put a needle inside, try to get the thickness, try the radius, try to get the Young's model. Those are impossible though, you cannot do that. So the two challenges here, is, number one, how do you get all this quantity for a patient? And this patient, these values can be different in the arm, in the leg, in different body parts. And second challenge here, this is Young's model. This is not the blood vessel, uh, this is not the blood pressure we need. So that goes to the next equation. The next equation called Hughes equation. This is really an empirical relation. And Hughes simply assumes that the Young's modulus of the artery is related to blood pressure by this exponential relation. Okay. And this no, this is really an empirical relation. The basic idea is following. As the pressure increases, the blood vessel tend to be stiffened. Therefore, the Young's model increases. Therefore, he assumed an empirical relation. In this empirical relation here, there are two fitting parameters. One is E0. You can consider that the Young's modulus of artery when there's no blood pressure, when the pressure P equals zero. The other is a parameter theta. So keeping in mind, the MK equation, as I showed here at the bottom, relate the pulse wave velocity to Young's modulus. And Q's equation, which is totally empirical, relates the Young's modulus to blood pressure. But by combining this together, one can eliminate the Young's modulus to get the relation between blood pressure, P, and pulse wave velocity, PWV, through this logarithmic relation. And I want to emphasize that in this relation here, there are quite a few parameters we don't know. For example, two from the Hughes equation, E0 and theta. Three from the MK equation, which are the Young's model, which are uh, the, uh, thickness, radius of the artery, and also blood vessel, uh, uh, blood density. But if you look at this equation, those all these different unknown parameters appear independently as two fitting parameters. Why is this theta outside the lock? Outside the lock, that's theta, that's one fitting parameter. The other is a combination of the blood density, combination of the, um, radius and thickness of the, of the artery and E0. Those appear together, rho R divided by E0H. E Those 
appear together as one fitting curve. So the way to use this formula and to determine those parameters is that you go into a hospital or clinic, you measure the blood pressure independently. You can use a cuff to measure that independently. You fed a bunch of data. At the same time, each time you measure blood pressure, you measure the pulse wave speed. So you have a set of paired data, pulse wave velocity and blood pressure. Then use this set of data, you can curve it to get theta and this coefficient in front of log. Then after that, you get those two parameters and this patient can go home. If somehow at home, he can measure the pulse wave speed using this equation, he can infer the blood pressure. That's the basic idea. Uh, so that uh, we are quite bothered by this interpret. Where does it come from? Why we assume exponential? Why don't we assume, for example, a, a parabola? Why we don't we assume, for example, other relations? Uh, so we then decide to get the bottom of the MK equation and QC equation to see whether we can do a better job using some mechanics modeling to derive those equations. So we start from MK equation first. In the MK equation, the analysis actually has two parts, as I mark in this blue box and red box. The blue box is really the fluid, fluid mechanics analysis. Over there, they have certain assumptions. For example, it's incompressible in non-viscous flow. It's straight and cylindrical tube, the one dimensional flow, it's freestanding artery. So, using these assumptions, it's actually not MK, it's Bornwell and Hill derive the pulse wave velocity related to the derivative of the pressure with respect to the radius. Okay, so this equation here, Bornwell and Hill, I'll go over that a bit later on with details. But first of all, just using the fluid mechanics, just fluid mechanics, you relate, you derive the pulse wave velocity already. Now go into the solid mechanics part, just to analyze the blood vessel. The MK make two assumptions. Number one, the blood vessel is a very, it's very thin. It's a thin wall. Number two, during this uh, blood vessel expansion the thickness of blood vessel remains constant. The thickness does not change. In the term of our continuum mechanics terminology, those two things, the third one is a thin wall assumption. The second one is like small infinite small deformation. You assume thickness do not change, it's infinite small deformation. So based on these two assumptions assumption in linear elasticity, the MK can start from from Hill equation and derive the pulse wave velocity in terms of this famous formula, Young's modulus, thickness, radius of the artery, and the mass density of blood. By those, all these derivations, formulas, equations are very well documented in YC Fong's famous book on biomechanics. This is really good. So let's first go over the fluid mechanics part. And I'm not an expert on fluids, so I decided not to touch the fluid part. In the fluid part, it's one dimensional flow, and they established the, uh, they use the mass conservation. So on the left is mass inflow, on the, outside, on, the, on the right is mass outflow plus the mass increment. So in this derivation here, they involve the velocity, they involve the area, and also time. And after this, they make some simplification, they reach finally in this the, the equation at the bottom. And in this equation here, uh, it has the radius change, has also the velocity uh, gradient. I will try not to talk about many equations, but right just to give the idea of our approach. The detailed equation is given in our paper published uh, in this PNAS. Uh, then also using the momentum conservation on the left, it's uh, pressure on the left, this, the momentum on the left, on the, the, you have this on the right, and uh, you have acceleration term that you can derive pressure, related pressure to the velocity. By combining this together, 
and you can find eliminate some variables in the bottom you can see you, you get a relation for the pressure and that's really a wave equation naturally the coefficient in front of the double derivative of with respect to time that is related to the uh, pressure velocity uh, the, the wave velocity so in the end Bromwell and Q derived this uh, pulse wave velocity. So in this pulse, wave, you can see that at the bottom of this slide, the pulse wave velocity is related to the radius of the artery, to the derivative of the pressure with respect to the radius, and that's given here. And I want to emphasize in this derivation here, it's mainly fluid mechanics. So starting from Bromke and Q, this equation, the MK made one further assumption, actually two assumptions. One is the artery is very thin. The second is artery thickness is constant. During the blood vessel expansion, the, the thickness does not change. This basically, this constant thickness is equivalent to what we call the infinite small deformation in linear elasticity, infinite small deformation. So we began to examine the human artery and we find, well, those two assumptions actually may not hold, may not be true. Typically, it's well known in the shell theory, well, if you assume it's thin wall or thin shell, the thickness needs to be less than 5% of the radius of the wall. Like I said, H over R should be less than 0.05. That's for the thin shell assumption to hold. However, when we check the literature data, the thickness to radius ratio for human artery can be as low as 8%, already larger than this limit, and as high as 22 or even higher. Okay, So in this human artery, the thickness is not thin at all. One should not use thin cell theory. And the second of all, second of all uh, for this small deformation assumption, if you check for the blood vessel, when there's no pressure to this high blood pressure, the artery can expand by 30%. As we know, 30% strain, 30% strain, 30% expansion is by no means small deformation. So what we decided to do is we are going to throw away this MK equation. We are going to use a finite thickness thin shell, a finite thickness shell theory. We are going to use finite deformation rather than infinite small deformation. In addition, we check with a Hughes equation. It's a really an empirical relation. But can we do better than just empirical? Well, why are we use Hughes equation? Because we want to relate the Young's modulus to pressure. Well, the a natural way to do this would be to use the stress strain relation or so-called constitutive model of the artery. The constitutive model naturally relates all the stress to the ten uh, tangent modulus. Okay? If you think of material have nonlinear behavior, if you apply a large stress, then you can calculate the Young's modulus. So we are going to throw away the Hughes equation. We are going to use the constitutive model or the stress relation of the human artery to replace the Hughes equation. Okay. So this is our approach. We are going to make three changes. Number one, it's thick wall now. Number two, it's finite information. And number three, we are going to use the constitutive model, well defined in YC Fung's book to study this, to restudy this problem. But before we proceed, we have to keep in mind two things. Number one, the MK plus Qs, even though it's empirical, it's very simple. It involves only two parameters, okay? only two fitting parameters. So if we develop a complex theory, it can be accurate. If it involves more than two parameters, in the end, nobody would really use it. It's too complex. Even involve four or five parameters, no one would really use it. So keep in mind, we are trying to develop a more accurate theory, but in the end, the result has to be as simple 
as MK plus Q involving no more than two parameters. This, this way, this is the only way for other to convince people in medicine to use. But first, we need to test our theory to be correct or not. We cannot do it directly on the human body. So we divide, decide to do an in vitro experiment. So this is the, the next topic, pressure versus PWV for linear elastic tube walls. Uh, John Rogers, Professor John Rogers postdoc designed a very simple but very elegant experiment to measure the pulse wave speed in an in vitro system. If you look at this picture here, at the bottom, you see this blue color. Those are water, okay, those just water. And water is in a reservoir to mimic the artery heart. Then the water, this reservoir is connected to a tube. Inside the tube, you can see the blue color, those is water. This is water, okay? And therefore, by this device, the pressure inside the reservoir is very well characterized by the height on the, on the, from the right. On the right side of the tube, you can see a height H. From this H, then naturally, you can very easily, you can calculate the pressure inside the reservoir. Then to the left, you connecting to the, uh, to the left side of the pressure source uh, uh, of the artery or human artery uh, of this artery reservoir, we can apply a pressure source. Basically over there, you can squeeze. If you squeeze, you generate pressure disturbance that squeeze water through the tube and flow to the right. So inside the tube, we put two sensors. You can see that we call them sensor one in the middle and sensor two to the right. Those two sensors can detect the time when the water pass through the tube. And then naturally you can measure the time difference when the uh, pulse wave reach this sensor one, sensor two. And, you know, on the right, you can see that there's the delta T in the picture here, there's the delta T, that's the pressure difference. Knowing the distance L between two sensors, L divided by T give you the pressure, uh, give you the, the pulse wave velocity. So using this simple device here, using this uh, very, you know, uh, using this device here, you can measure the pressure from the height of the water on the right, you can measure the time difference for this pulse wave to arrive at sensor one, sensor two, then with the lens you can measure pulse wave speed, so you can measure both. So using this system, we can test our theory doing finite deformation, doing thick wall, doing the, uh, using the constant model to be correct or not. So now for this one, this is not human artery, this material is PDMS, so we need to measure the stress strain relation in order to use the, uh, to get um, its Young's modulus. So uh, uh, we already measured the stress strain relation and, and we find for this PDMS material, if we plot the true stress, if you see the picture on the right, we plot the true stress versus logarithmic strain. Again, this is what typically call a true stress versus logarithmic strain, we get a pretty linear curve between them. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind this PDMS undergoes large deformation. When we talk about the linear relation between stress and strain, you must care which stress, which strain. This is not the nominal stress. This is not the engineering stress. This is not the second peak, this is a two stress. The strain, this is not the engineering stress, this is logarithmic strain, okay? So under the two stress and logarithmic strain, without, between, below 30% of logarithmic strain, the material is linear elastic. Okay. So we are going to use this material to study our relation then compare with the experiment data. From this, we can also measure the experiment, uh, measure the Young's modulus. Now we need to do, do the analysis. As this analysis is a lot harder than the MK equation because two things. Number one, it's a thick wall. Therefore, one has to solve the differential equation. If it's a thin wall, then the, the stress is approximately constant. There's no differential equation. 
Okay, but for a thick wall, one has to solve the differential equation. Second of all, we are going to assume large deformation. Okay, so for large deformation, the stress here, we must say which stress. This is the true stress. This is not the nominal stress. This is not the second TK stress. This is the true stress. And the string here really represents the logarithmic string. So it, the first equation in the middle part, that is the equilibrium equation, but in the current deformed configuration, which are, we call, use the coding called R, little r. Little r is the deformed coding in the current configuration. Then the pressure, if you integrate, you can relate the pressure to the integration of the stress distribution. And this is part. Pressure is related to stress distribution. But how do we get stress? Well, stress, if one use the stress free relation or constant model, then you can get this in terms of strength. And strength can be related to the radius. So from this one, using the stress free relation, as I will show in the next slide, we can find a relation between stress we can find the relation between the blood pressure and the current deformed radius of the tube. Using the bram pell equation, then if we do derivative, we can get the relation between pressure and pulse wave velocity. Okay? So the key idea here is that we use the stress strain relation of this material, and we can get the relation between pressure and pulse wave velocity. So I will show you in the next slide. So this illustrate. Uh, for this PDM material, there's a linear elastic relation between the true stress and logarithmic strain. So we substitute this into our integration. We can find in the bottom, we find this pressure in terms of the current deformed radius of the vessel in terms of this complex integration. Okay. So if you go to the next slide, you can see it here. In this slide here, the formula looks awfully complex. And, but when I look at this formula, I already realized that there's no way any medical doctors can, will use those formulas in their, in their model. Okay? But we still decide to proceed. So the idea here is we first make them accurate, make them correct. Then later on, we simplify them for applications. So in this approach here, uh, we can continue to use the current radius of the bl blood vessel, but we decide to use the area A. This is the deformed, the, the area of the deformed blood vessel. So you can see this uh, expression here. We, uh, the first equation in the red box, that is the pressure. The second equation is the pulse wave velocity. And they involve some very complex expressions, formulas, involving a, a, a function which I never heard before. It's called di logarithmic function, d log, di log, the di log function. But it's just a function, just like sine, cosine, it's a, it's a function. And, but you can think this way this gives the parametric equation of the pressure and pulse wave velocity. Velocity. In other words, pressure is related to this cross section area A. Pulse, ve pulse wave velocity is also related to the pulse wave uh, velocity, uh, it's also related to A. If one eliminates A, then one can relate the pulse wave velocity to blood pressure as given in the bottom equation here. Okay? So I want to emphasize in real life, equation is too complex. You cannot ex eliminate them explicitly, but this is really a parametric equation. If you, for any A, you can plot P and pulse wave uh, velocity, so you can plot this relation. So in this relation here, after we, you do all the analysis, you normalize the pulse wave velocity, you normalize the pressure, then there's one additional parameter left. That is the thickness to radius ratio of the initial blood vessel, okay? So now we have the pressure and pulse wave relation involving this H0 over R0. That's the, the initial thickness to radius ratio of the tube. So we have this relation now. 
And we want to see whether this relation is agrees with the experiment or not. So we start to plot them. And in this one, in this slide, we plot the normalized pressure versus the normalized pulse wave velocity for our model. And the thickness to radius ratio of the vessel before deformation is 0 0.1, 0 0.1. It's same as experiment. So in our model here, we call the present model, you can see a black curve, okay? And that is curved and clearly you see the dependence of pressure on pulse wave velocity. In the MK equation, if you apply MK equation, very clearly, it's a straight line that marked by that red curve, red straight line. It doesn't depend on the pulse wave at all. The reason is that in the MK equation, pulse wave velocity is given to the Young's model. It has nothing to do with pressure. Okay, the pressure has nothing to do with the pulse wave velocity. So we get this equation. And I want to emphasize in this equation, why our theory is very different from MK? Well, you can think there are two differences. Number one, our theory works for large deformation. But when the pressure is small, you can see in the horizontal axis, in the horizontal axis, when the pressure is almost zero, our black curve and the MK right straight line, they intersect with the horizontal axis are fairly close. The red straight line intersect at 0 0.225 roughly, and ours intersect at the value of 0 0.21, it's pretty close. Why is that? Well, that when the pressure is small, our finite deformation degenerate to the linear elastic deformation, okay? So this small difference is really the effect of the finite wall thickness. Okay, when the pressure is small, the red and bring that the red and and black that small difference is the uh, uh, finite thickness theory. However, as the pressure increase, you can see the red straight line and black curve rapidly deviates, and this difference is due to Finite elasticity. Okay, so this pick, this slide here illustrate for small pressure the difference is due to the finite wall thickness. At large pressure, it's combined both finite thickness and finite pressure, or finite deformation. But how good is our theory as compared to MK? Then we compare with experiments. In the experiments, we have uh, the next slide shows the experiments. You see three curves on the, in the left figure. Those are for three different material, 15 to one ratio and 70 to one and 19 to one ratio of PDM. Those three different PDMS. And clearly, oh, by the way, those dots are experimental data. You can see excellent agreement between our theory and the experiment without any parameter fitting. I want to emphasize there's no parameter fitting. We get the Young's modulus, we get the uh, from the uh, uh, tensile test of the tube, then this is a prediction, it agrees very well with the experiment. And we also tried different wall thickness. For the picture on the right, for the figure on the right, you can see we tried two different thickness of 0 0.29 millimeter and thicker one 0 0.63 millimeter. And for both different thickness, you can see our models still agree very well with experiment of the uh, for the for this, this um, uh, thick tube for this um, uh, uh, PDMS tube. So this very clearly shows that the finite elasticity theory with finite thickness works very well, can capture the experiment quite accurately without any parameter fitting. So that leads us to apply the theory to human artery. For human artery, the major issue is that we cannot use linear, elastic, linear elasticity anymore. We cannot. We still use the finite deformation theory. We still use 
finite thickness of the wall, but the material behavior is far from linear elastic. In fact, we checked the literature, we checked the YC Feng's biomechanics book. For human artery, there is a very standard hyper-elastic model given in the book. Okay. And they gave the string energy density, W, in terms of the strengths. In this approach here, in this constitutional model, three parameters are involved. One is capital C, one is A1, the last is A2. What are those? Well, you can view this way. C, capital C, is pretty much related to the Young's modulus of the human artery. And A1, A2 represents the uh, related to the string in the circumferential uh, expression when the tube expands, also in the axial direction. So in this approach here, everything is the same as I did for my linear elastic model shown earlier, which is verified by experiment. The only difference is we replace that linear elastic model by this hyper elastic model, okay? But be even before I start, I already got worried. Why? Because this model clearly involved three parameters, C, A1, and A2. And that one is not helping us in the sense that the MK plus Q has only two. Here, you already got three parameters. How do you get the value? You cannot imagine to test those values for a, for a human body when he or she is still alive. So what do we do? Well. We'll come up some way to handle this. But the key here is that we proceed with the finite elasticity model. Then following the same approach, we'll sk I'll skip details here, we derive the pressure in terms of the current area. We derive the pulse wave velocity in terms of curve and area. And once again, you can view this as a parametric equations. And this current area, A, is the parameter. And in this relation here, even though our, the, our quite accurate solution of the finite elasticity, terribly to involve some functions called imaginary error function. Okay, those are you know, not so well known, but you can look them up. Those are called imaginary error function. It's well defined. You can treat them like sine, cosine, just a special function. Once you eliminate this parameter A, then the form would look like the normalized path at the bottom. The normalized path wave velocity is really to normalize pressure and A1, which is really in the costume model and the thickness ratio. So I want to emphasize sorry, in this formula here, the normalized pressure wave, the path wave velocity and normalized pressure and those are the relation we are interested. We want to find the relation. But it involves one additional parameter, which is A1. That is that appears in the, the hyperelastic constant model for human artery. So we can start to plot them. And we can plot the normalized pressure versus the normalized velocity. And we tried uh, you know, different stretching level in the Z direction, the axial direction. We find they are pretty much the same if you look at the picture on the right. So this tells us the parameter A2 characterizing the axial string is not so important. And we can really relate this, even though it involves three parameters, one is not so, it does not affect the human artery uh, pulse wave velocity relation. So it reduced down to two relations, two parameters. Uh, so finally, we have derived those complex equations. We know that nobody would use, but we'll still decide to compare our relation with the traditional use of MK plus Q. But when we compare, we run into the trouble. Hughes is a fitting. Hughes parameter is a fitting. So how do you compare with the Hughes fitting? Uh, uh, MK plus Qs if we don't know those fitting parameters E0 and theta. So what we decided to do is that, well, we are going to calculate 
the Young's models using YC Feng's hyper-elastic model. In this exact model, all the parameters are suggested. They can, could have some variation, but they suggest certain values. So we can use YC Feng's hyper-elasticity model plus the Young's modulus versus the pressure. And in this pressure, then we use in the Hughes equation, we still had to fit, then we fit, we fit the YC Feng's hyper-elasticity model. So we can get the two fitting parameters E zero and theta, okay? And, uh, but the thing is the two, M, the exponential relation by Hughes and the YC Feng's look very different. Okay, you can see the, they start from different points and it just look very different. So we decide to limit ourselves to fit only in the range of human blood pressure, basically from five to 20 kPa. We said we only care about human blood pressure. We fit the Hughes equation is parameter only in this range. So you can see in this range, the black curve by YC Fong's model and the red curve by Hughes agree reasonably well. Of course, it's a curve fitting, it's agree reasonably well. But after curve fitting the Hughes equation, then in the MK plus Hughes model, there's absolutely no more parameter to fit. So next we compare. And we compare the blood pressure versus the pulse wave velocity in the picture on the right. The black curve shows our model. Basically, we use finite elasticity, we use finite wall thickness, we use the YC Fong's hyper elastic potential for human artery. And the red curve that's used infinite small thickness that use Q's equation too, but it's fitted to the YC Fong's constant model and it's empirical. You can see the two, this relation, the two curve are very different, okay? You can see the red and black for the same pulse wave velocity and it can be different by a factor of two, okay? So this clearly shows that if you use M K plus Hughes, if you fit the Young's model, if you try to get the modulus to correct, then you cannot get the pulse wave pressure correct. You cannot get those. Like in the picture on the left, if you try to get the Young's modulus correct, then the pressure is way off. But you can, one can choose to fit the pressure versus the pulse wave velocity the other way, okay? like the typical people doing, they can use MK plus Q to fit the pressure with the pulse wave velocity. Well, you can get this one to be correct by curve fitting. But if you look at picture on the right, then you cannot get the Young's modulus correct, okay? So, but looking at those, we have some relations that are different from MK plus Qs. But those relations, as I shown in this box, in the top box, no one would use it. Uh, even I feel that's too complex. That one, you can publish a paper, but it will have no practical use. So immediately, we need to simplify those relations to such a simple form that everyone with high school degrees can understand what they are. And also, fit for the pitting parameter, it cannot be more than two. If it's more than two, then people may not use it. So we want to derive a formula that's based on the mechanics model, but involving the same number or fewer than, from, uh, than the MK plus Qs. So the idea to deal with this is that we look at the, uh, uh, the range of human blood pressure. If you calculate human blood pressure from five to 20 M M uh, kPa, then one can calculate the area over A0, which is the initial area, is typically between 2.5 and 3.5, okay, between 2.5. And this value, even though it does not look too large, but if this value, using this value, if you calculate this imaginary error function, well, this under this value, the imaginary error function can be rep well represented by this asymptotic form. It's given in the top, 
as you can see that lot formula in the top here is given by e to the x squared divided by square root pi x. So I want to illustrate a asymptotic form here a bit. This is really similar to Taylor expansion. You can expand Taylor expansion, the power series, but that's for x to be small, such as zero. This is for expansion when x is really large. So when x is approaching really large, approaching infinity, then this, this is the, the imaginary error function can be well represented by this uh, uh, e to the power x squared. Then the red box, even though it's very complex, doing this uh, asymptotic expansion becomes a much simpler form. This much simpler form has area A uh, shown directly involving this exponential function. So using this exponential function, then we can solve analytically to solve this parameter A in terms of pressure and PWB. So using this relation at the bottom, go to the next slide, we already solved the parameter A, then we substitute into the parametric equation. So finally, we reach an asymptotic solution, asymptotic equation of the pressure pulse wave speed. So if you look at this equation, I want to emphasize the area A disappeared. It's eliminated already. So in this equation here, only the pulse wave speed, pulse wave velocity, and pressure shows up. Okay, this is a direct relation between pulse wave velocity and pressure. But this equation still looks pretty complex. I mean, you cannot, looking at this equation, you cannot get a simple analytical solution. Uh, what we decide to do is to study this a bit further. And we know in this equation here, the first term, the logarithm term, that it's a very slow growth term that is very weak dependent. So if we pretend we throw away that logarithm term of P over C, then you find this is the equation of the square root related log. And that one has an analytical solution. Okay? I want to emphasize, if you just deal with this log risk of the, the square root and another square root term on both sides, and you have an analytical solution. That analytical solution is that the pressure is linear proportional to the pulse wave speed square. Okay? So I know without a pointer, it might be difficult to, to say which equation I'm solving, but uh, let me try to illustrate once more because this is important. In the second equation from the top, which I mark asymptote, if you throw away the first term log P over C, the rest equation, even though it looks com complex, it has an analytical solution. A solution is pressure is linear proportional to the pulse wave speed. Okay, pulse wave velocity. Now we plot that solution, a symptote solution, which is the present model we find on the, for the curve on the right. It looks like it's the sim simple shape. So we need to make this correction. That simple correction is in the red box, in the formula in the red box, you simply add a term. So that now the pressure wave, uh, the pressure is related to the pulse wave velocity square plus constant. So let me emphasize, the first term, PWB squared, come from the analytical solution. The second term is a correction to make sure the, to, to, to correct the difference between the asymptote and present model. So in the end, all those complex equations involving the imaginary error functions can be very well simplified to this square relation. And I want to emphasize, in this square relation, there are two parameters, okay? Alpha and beta. Those alpha and beta, just like M MK plus Q, they can only be determined by experiments. But instead of using log, we can use this parametric equation, or we can use this uh, quadratic equation to determine the simple relation between pulse wave velocity and pressure. So before I proceed to show our result, compare with our experiment, I want to emphasize, we start something that does not have a solid mechanics model. We use, really want to use accurate mechanics model. 
constantly model, everything try to be precise. We realize it's too complex. So we have to simplify. Once we simplify, we boil it down to this simple formula. But the good thing about simple formula, it has the same number of fitting parameters as the, the old formula. But the simple formula here, we can still determine alpha and beta. What do you do? For each patient, you go to the hospital, you can measure the blood pressure independently. You can measure the pulse wave velocity independently. Get a bunch of data, you can fit alpha, beta. And this person now can go home and knowing the alpha, beta, then at home, you don't need to measure the pressure anymore. You just measure the pulse wave velocity. I'll show you how. Then you can use this one to calculate easily the blood pressure. So how good is this model? Well, let's compare this our model with the uh, theoretical model. So in this picture, the top left figure, that's a comparison, that's a comparison of this quadratic relation with the present, the accurate model shown before. You can see, you can fit alpha and beta and make them excellent agreement. We can also compare with the literature, literature data. Okay, uh, uh, that's picture on the right. You see a bunch of dots. Those are experimental data made reported by others, by Cheng, Wen, Tao, and B, uh, uh, um, by other people. You can uh, once again see a good fit between our model and the experiment data. You can also fit with our own ex experiment data. This is the experiment. Uh, this is the device developed by. John, uh, John Rogers and his group, and also his uh, companies. You can see this uh, devices you put on the shoulder here. You can use this to measure the uh, uh, blood pressure, really measure the pulse wave velocity. So once again, this is, you can see that this is, the red curve is our fitting, and the dots here are experimental data. And you can see once again, good relation. So using this simple quadratic relation, you can uh, get the relation between pulse wave velocity and pressure. You fit this in a clinic's environment. Then you can go home and use this to measure the blood pressure at home. So using this, then you do not need to carry a cuff with you, which can wake you up at night, which is not so convenient, which can also cause tissue damage. You also do not need those invasive uh, artery lines. So this paper was published uh, in 2018 in PNAS. I just want to briefly summarize. And the motivation is to develop a simple device that can measure the blood pressure anytime at home, in, out, outside the clinic. For that, we need the pressure dependence on pulse wave velocity. We find the traditional way are inaccurate involving some ad hoc assumptions in pure correlations. We decided to really dig into the bottom of this, rederive everything, get some complex equation, then simplify it into a simple form for other people to use. Then in the end, it involved the same number of fitting parameters as traditional. So there's no more uh, extra effort in experiment part. In the end, it's a simple way to measure the blood pressure. Thank you. I'll give you a clap. There you go. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, um, uh, Yang Gong. So, um, all the panelists, could I ask you to turn on your uh, videos so that we can have a lively discussion? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, I think you're on your video. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and let's see if you have a question, I believe if you can raise your hand. How do I, how do I raise my hand virtually? If I'm a uh, we see your we see you raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> if you go down to panelists, um, not panelists. Um, actually, that's a good question. You can't see the panelists, can you? Um, she gone? Yeah, he can. Uh, you cannot. So Zoom is weird. Uh, I cannot either. So if you I cannot can. see your uh, hand, you just raise your real hand. 
Okay. It's virtual anyway. It's virtual versus virtual virtual. <laughs> oh, <confusing. laughs> Great. I think I can see all the panels. But how do I add panelists? Before everyone gets tired of raising their hand, let me just ask that last question. How do I add panelists for those who want to add, answer questions, ask questions? Oh, uh, we will handle that. You okay. just uh, focus your attention on the screen. You have enough yeah. thing to worry about. <laughs> okay. Guys, since you've been so enthusiastic at raising your hand, please start us off. Well, well thanks. First, let me say thanks so much. Uh, this was... As you know, this was, it was a lot of fun hanging out with you and everyone else here, all 300 people virtually. Uh, so I- Thank you. This, this is a, a fun research project. Now, one thing I didn't have a good physical feel for, I'd love to get your, your insight on, is, is that you know, for, for the linear elastic material, that relationship between pressure and pulse wave velocity, that was concave down. And then, of course, when you put in the, the Fung model, so there's some parameters uh, for, that, that are more realistic for, for an artery. It did what I expect. It goes concave up, and, uh, which is what we expect because, for example, a, a aortic dissection is more likely to occur when, when, you're, when you're lifting weights, and so high pulse wave velocity. Can you I see, help uh, me understand uh, why that switched? Uh, uh, hold on. When you... Uh... When you say concave up or concave down, are you, uh, let me let me go back just, uh, I want to make sure I'm talking about the same slide. Great, thanks. Uh, 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 it's a hassle I could describe them. It's a hassle to find them. So, so the, are the, you, the, let me turn this on to just to make sure it is the slide you are referring to. Are you talking about this slide? Concave up, concave down? Yeah, so, the, so there, the, the, with the low pulse wave velocity, high pressure means lower pulse wave velocity uh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. then, uh, then when you look at your, your improved model, that's yeah. what more, more like what I expect. Do you have yeah. a physical feel for this? Yes, yes. Uh, the reason is that um, for this PDMS, it's a very soft material. It's a linear elastic. But when your pressure is large enough or significantly large, then the wall thickness becomes very thin. It loses its tensile stiffness. Therefore, that's why the velocity, possible velocity, reaches zero. So if you see this curve here on the uh, left point where I put my mouse, I don't know whether you can see this one, because the pulse wave velocity even reaches zero even reach zero. This is because you're pushing material to the limit and the material has no more load carrying capacity. This is really because finite deformation. However, for human arteries, that curve by itself can continue to go up. So this is a major difference between this material and the human artery. Very cool. Can I ask a follow on or is that poor form where there are 300 people waiting? Just one more. And that no follow so the follow-up question is that so the, physiologically then this is really important because when you when your when your heart pumps harder it pumps harder because it needs to get oxygen through the body faster so it needs to increase the pulse wave velocity. What features of a constitutive law are needed for that to happen? Oh, I am not really the one to answer that question, but I really trust YC Feng's work. I mean, in YC Feng's. Uh, constitute a, a book, it's, uh, I mean, this hyper elastic potential they develop can do very well for human artery. They have shown a lot of data as well as for other animals. So this is why we don't develop constant We borrow the constant model from YC Fung's book to develop our model. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, Yunggang, can I ask you to turn off your unshare your screen? Sure. Thank you. All right, we have a question from David Weitz. Uh, hi, hi. Yeah. Uh, I have some. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, David, David yeah. Weitz. Okay, yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, just to respond a bit to Zhigong, I find that if I click on the participants, there's a list there in the bottom of that, there's a somewhere where you can raise your hand. So you can raise your hand easily. 
Um, so my question, uh, first of all, let me say that it's, it's absolutely beautiful. I, I really enjoyed your talk. I thought it was very, very impressive. Don't take my question the wrong way. It's being a little bit of a hard ass. But thank you. Um, um, no, don't thank me. Um, <laughs> you know, your goal really was to find a way, as far as I could tell, the, the goal, the real ultimate goal, as you kept emphasizing, is to use this. You want to make sure you can use it. And you uh, worked with John, who created a device that uh, you, know, you can monitor it. Do you really gain anything from a utility point of view by going through this beautiful derivation? Or could you have just taken some uh, empirical way of fitting things and done essentially as well? I know it's, it's beautiful that you understand it, and that's fantastic. It really is. And I, I appreciate it. I would, love, I would never be able to listen to this talk. But from a practical point of view, does this really uh, gain something? Very good point, very good point. First of all, uh, well, I hesitate, but I had to show that slide because that, that shows the experiment data. Uh, just one second. Uh, Uh, David, uh, you are absolutely correct. From a practical point of view, one can just say, well, with this data, can I fit this by another curve? Right. For example, one can use this, uh, fit this by the MK plus Qs. However, if you fit MK plus Qs with this bunch of data, you will find it's very difficult. The reason MK plus Qs gives logarithmic relation, right? Logarithmic. If you use this relation here, you can see it really goes up. It doesn't look logarithmic. It's supposed to be slowing down, increasing slower and slower, but this is different. So using MK class Qs, there are quite some data you cannot fit well. That's number one. Number two, there are also suggestions. Can people say, well, maybe with this bunch of data, can we fit this by a linear straight line? Of course you can. You can fit this by linear straight line. But why not linear straight line? Why not a parallel? Why not some other thing? So we want to have some theoretical basis. And one theoretical basis, as I will show in this uh, 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 slide here, is that we want to look at the limit when the pulse wave velocity approaches zero, which means your artery is really stretched to the almost losing the load carrying capacity. If you follow the original Grunwell and Hill relation, then one should get this relation. The derivative should also be zero. Uh, I can show it here. That, that fits perfectly well with people. Uh, it should have zero slope when, when the blood vessel lose the load carrying capacity. However, if you do the linear relation, you don't get zero. If you do log rates, we get the infinite. And only when you do square, the square, not only when you do square, you get the mean. So we want not only to do a mechanics model, but we also want at some extreme case, it has the correct limit. That's our point. But the other thing is that it's fun. It's fun to work on mechanics problems. It's really fun. That's a great answer. <laughs> the, the last part is also very important. So I, I agree completely. So thanks a lot. That was beautiful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, Xiao. Hi, Xuan. Hi, Xuan Hao. Yeah. Uh, you got very impressive work. You start uh, something very classic problem. Uh, I work in the blood vessel area, so it's very- I know, you are expert problem. in this area. Uh, you went into the detail, very complex detail, but come back to a very simple thing, very easy to use. Uh, so I have just uh, some general question. So you consider basically a cylindrical tube. So you know, in the real artery, they have curvature, tapering. So how do you use your equation to incorporate that kind of a uh, parameter, the variations? I cannot. But I don't think MK plus Qs can do it either. I mean, oh, think this way, yeah. <laughs> think this way, I, I'm, I'm, right now, I cannot account for all this different complexity, but I don't think the tube uh, uh, shape, cylindrical shape or ellipse shape 
matter that much. It, it may, but I, 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 right now the simple answer I cannot. Otherwise, I will. It will involve some more complex factor, much more complex than the imaginary error function, which I have to do. Okay, great, Franz. Uh, okay, hi, good hi. Hi, Zhang Jian is here. Uh, it's a very good uh, presentation. I have some little bit question. Uh, this formula is uh, recording the blood pressure with the velocity relation. Whether they can, you can you uh, suggest any further more to get the the power, uh, pressure with time history? Because this is uh, very important in the Chinese medicine. They use the the shape, pressure shape with time to justify the healthy of the person? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, very good question, very good question. Uh, but that one, that can be done separately. For example, in Professor John Rogers' uh, uh, lab, they now have device, not only can measure the blood pressure, they can measure the ECG at home. Okay, you can put a device here, you can measure ECG. And you can me really measure the ECG shape. Using that shape, one can infer a lot of useful data. But we are not trying to use this blood pressure one device to, to do both. In fact, uh, that device I showed you, if you see a little, little one put on the shoulder here, that one can measure ECG, blood pressure, and several other things all together, all, all embedded in one sensor, all, all embedded in one system. OK, thank you. Uh, Franz? Hello, Yongang, good to see you. Very yeah, much. Franz, great to see you. Um, Great question. Do you think that these fitting parameters that you uh, will get when you use this can uh, are of any use clinically? Okay, and that is, can you get something about the patient's uh, state from that? And related to that, as I understand it, some medications for uh, blood pressure have to do with changing the mechanical properties of the artery. Can you see this? Do you think have, have you have have you have evidence that you can use your uh, equation to fit that more more precisely these sorts of uh, treatments? Uh, 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 let me first answer your uh, uh, answer your first question, which is uh, those parameters uh, can that tell the state of the patient? Yes, it can. Um, if you think that uh, at the same location, one can determine those parameters in the hospital go home, but let's say half a year later, you go back to the hospital, you remeasure, you, if you find those parameters substantially changed, that really indicates something is going on, something has changed. And yep. the, uh, the second thing regarding the, uh, uh, the whether if a patient takes, if after taking medicine, whether those parameters change, th those parameters should change. Because typically, after taking the medicine, for example, the uh, material property can change, the some radius may change, thickness may change, all those things may change. So uh, only when only when under the assumption that the thickness and radius do not change much, then one can correlate this fitting term alpha beta to the elastic modulus, then from that we can relate the Young's modulus change. That we can cover a relation between Young's modulus change and the, the changing alpha. Yeah, now my question was really, do you have an additional tool to analyze this? If you do a general study and look at lots of people and whether your parameters will uh, give a more, more insight than we have so far in, in analyzing uh, large, large populations of, of, of people. De definitely, definitely fully agree. Well, well I, we have started to look at a lot of Data. I mean, we find the medical data really scattered all over the place, all over the place. But but uh, uh, that's something. So it's also important for to get um, to get uh, you know uh, to try to get you know more medical doctors in this field to to test this. Yeah. By the way, Professor Spartan, I I really uh, want to thank you for teaching me the AP two uh, two <laughs> I well, was a student uh, at Harvard. Uh, your course is the hardest, absolute hardest, absolutely absolute the hardest course at, at Harvard. But well, uh, in, my, in my midterm, I got 100%, which I was very proud. <laughs> yes, I remember it well. And, and 
for, for good measure, this coming semester, I'll be doing it online for the first time, which will be quite an experience. So thank you. Thank you. Along the line of that, let me follow up on that question. So blood pressure is not constant within the body, right? It, it, it varies with position, it varies with heart rate. I'm sure if I stand up, it's different than if I sit down. Um, and if material properties, especially since we know that it, it can, material properties can increase in a J-shaped curve with this, how robust are the fitting parameters for normal activity? I mean, if you're wanting to continuously monitor these people, are they limited to sitting down when they're mon being monitored? Can they be up and about? Can it, is it robust through the diurnal variation of blood pressure? Oh, very good question. Very good question. Uh, certainly, this two fitting parameters, alpha and beta, they depend strongly on people. Different people can have different values. Not only that, different body parts can have different values. So when this is tested, it's very important to test at the consistent place to, to use this. And of course, like uh, uh, Vicky mentioned, when a person moves up and down uh, exercise, the blood pressure can change. But what we are saying, those changes are reflected in the pulse wave. So we do not believe this alpha beta depends strongly on your motion. Instead, it depends on the people, depending on the location. But when, the, when, you, when you do all kinds of sports, your blood pressure change, your pulse waves change accordingly. This is, and this, of course, can be further uh, tried. For example, we can test this when this person is stationary to get a set of alpha beta. For the same location, we let this person do jogging and try to test the alpha beta. But this remains to be further tested. We don't believe this alpha beta will, ch will change substantially uh, due to people's motion. So, so uh, may, can, maybe it, uh, let me follow up on that, and maybe dig a little bit deep, deeper than this. Uh, we understand that if the material properties do not change, then the alpha beta, generally speaking, should not change, regardless whether you, you are running or you are stationary. However, when biochemistry changes, that can result in the property change. Yes. yes. That may lead to the alpha beta change. Yes. So what type of things can, you, can lead to biochemistry change? For example, sleeping may, may not have the same, uh, you know, the same biochemistry going through as you're running or as you're uh, in, a, in the general uh, wake state. Do you have any evidence of, do, have you ever tested the alpha beta values under different uh, sleeping condition, wake condition, and all those different conditions? We have not uh, uh, tried different alpha beta yet. This really requires more systematic, systematic medical study beyond probably in Professor John Rogers' lab. But we have found literature data of when people take medicine, their blood pressure, blood pressure can really change. So those alpha and beta could, could depend on the chemist, biochemistry, very possibly. But we just don't have, have not done any testing on those yet. Thank you. Tahir, you've been very patient. So let me call yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very nice, very nice morning here. Um, first you, of all, if, if you go to the hospital, the, my biggest fear is people come to check your blood pressure three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and it's by design that you cannot sleep, you cannot rest. Or when you're about to rest and somebody comes and say, oh, I need to check your BPs and you know, vitals. And if there is a way that somebody may, can make measurements of blood pressures without you know, pressing and squeezing the arms, I think that's a huge benefit, which I don't think uh, is still apparent. I mean, my mom was very sick and I knew how difficult it is to be in the hospitals just because somebody's waking you up to make the blood pressure measurements. Now, going back you. Uh, uh, about your, uh, the parameter space, and that's something I think is a little bit, uh, is an issue that is bugging me a little bit. So the values that you can get uh, to make, make the measurement of the blood pressure, one has to do the calibration of alpha and beta, correct? 
mm -hmm. for a given patient. So now, if we assume that that those parameters don't change in a short time scale, for example, that's fine. But the moment I go to the doctor's office, those parameters would have to be evaluated first, characterized first, and then the blood pressure measurements would come, right? If I go to the yeah. doctor's office later, that has to be done again. Yeah. Uh, what I was suggesting is that go to doctor's office do a standard cuff test mm -hmm. on blood pressure, standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, use PWB, right? You mm -hmm. can get this set of data. Right, right, right. Then, then you get alpha and beta, mm -hmm. you get a parameter. Then maybe six months later, you can go back and recalibrate this alpha and beta. But you still have to calibrate by taking multiple measurements, right? To, to get the fitting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Basically, like, not too many, maybe, uh, a few, a few data points that you can get. Correct, correct. And that depends on where you put the sensors, location of the sensors. Correct. Right. So if, if I, for a given patient, if I know the alpha beta, and then six months later or after hospitalization, it has to be placed in the same location or correct. New location, but re, re, recalibrate again, right? It should be put on the same location. It should be put on the same location. Correct. Because then, substantial change from the lag from the arm, the, the alpha beta can be different. Right, but even for the even for the arm, <clears throat> it has to be more or less the same location within the yeah. arm, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So that adds a, a level of um, additional work to make sure that the blood pressure that we report uh, would be valid, right? Uh, true. It, it true. seems to me that when the patient is hospitalized, when blood pressure measurements have to be taken several times a day, uh, then it becomes very very useful compared to going to the normal physical check once in a while and checking the blood pressure. It looks yes. like that's where I think the distinction of where it can be most applied and useful comes into play. Yes, and in addition, uh, once put there, the data can be sent wirelessly. So you don't need to, yeah. 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 I mean, sure. the data gets continuous. You can, you can from, the, from the cell phone, I mean, one can read it. From the, right. yeah, from the C, one can read that data continuously. Okay. Can so, I ask a really naive question to follow up on that? How do you measure, how do you vary a PWV? Do you just have people running so that they have different heart rates? Uh, how do you verify what? The pressure. pulse wave velocity. Do you just have people running uh, so that they have different heart rates and that's how you get different pulse wave velocities and how much variation can you get through there? Oh, no, no, no. yeah, yeah. For example, we, we don't, we can measure, the device puts it, that can measure. Right. And, and this one here, when people even at different times, don't even do different times during the day, even not doing any sports, the blood pressure can vary. No, I mean the, the pulse wave velocity, how do you vary that? Is it by heart, does it, is it related to heartbeat, heart rate? Yeah, it's related to heartbeat. It's related to heartbeat. So can I follow up on that one? So one question that I wanted to ask you is, it looks like in the model, the waves propagate in one direction, um, but in the, but there are, is it possible that when the blood pressure bifurcates, some of the waves come back and there could be interference? And uh, so I didn't see in the model how that can yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, the current model ac cannot account for these details yet. I mean, it's pretty complex, pretty complex. I mean, all this, like, uh, uh, like, uh, Professor Han mentioned there are a lot of things this model missed, for example, the curvature, the bending, and all those things. Right mm. now, it's a simple model, but we want at least to have some maximum. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it missed miss a lot of detailed information. But the problem is that those, number one, those important informations are people dependent. Different people can have very different things. Mm -hmm. And also those important are very difficult to obtain anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, for the same person, different body parts, and, and it's, yeah, it's very difficult, different, difficult to get all the detailed information. So let me. Right now, we just lump all the detail into alpha and beta. As long as the same location, mm -hmm. everything is lumped into alpha, beta, but it must be the same location. That, that's the key. Mm -hmm. Let me call on Nanshu. Hey, Nanshu, how are you? Hey, Vicky, thanks. Hi, Nanshu. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, very detailed and um, uh, solid um, work for modeling the blood pressure 
uh, versus uh, possible velocity relationship. So um, I first have a, uh, an answer for Vicky's question um, because we also worked on the uh, um, blood, uh, blood pressure sensing uh, tattoo on the chest and we can measure the systolic time interval and the blood pressure relation. It's almost linear, it's purely empirical. And the way we used to uh, significantly change one's blood pressure is to do something called the Vasava maneuver. So we basically hold our breath and pressurize ourselves internally. And that can vary one's blood pressure by uh, up to 30 millimeter mu uh, mercury. That is one uh, standard way to do this kind of uh, uh, huge variation of blood pressure. So um, uh, uh, Vicky is right. The uh, coefficient depends on uh, many, many things like the posture, whether we are standing or seating or lying, they are all different. And the body, different body sections, they're also different. So uh, as Yonga mentioned, we should always uh, uh, use the same um, distance and same location to do the uh, calibration. That, that is the best um, practice. Um, but I have a, a question for Professor Huang is, um, we know some devices measure the PWV from the chest to the fingertip. Because practically when we measure this uh, um, pulse wave velocity uh, for, for better measurement uh, of the velocity, we choose, uh, uh, we prefer to use longer distance, mm -hmm. um, right? So in this case, it is uh, uh, no longer within one blood vessel, uh, a, mm -hmm. a simple um, uh, model. We have all of those uh, uh, complicated complexity and the capillaries and all those. So, um, do you have any uh, suggestion or, or idea whether this uh, square relation is still applicable, or what kind of uh, modifications should be done there? Well, we have not really done uh, enough to to answer that whether this relation can be applied for for a long distance from the arm all the way to fingertip. I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot of you know, blood vessels, things can get, get pretty complex. Uh, this is why in uh, Zhang's device, you see, it's a, it's a small and push gear, the distance is pretty small. So that one, you can really focus on a single artery to, to do this analysis. Yeah. So yeah. I don't have the answer to you, but I imagine if one, to answer your question, one need to do large scale simulation to very different artery branching and all these things could be pretty complex. And certainly I don't expect any analytical model to, 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 to exist for those. Yeah, one has to rely on numerical, large numerical simulation for them. Right, using a small patch can uh, really locate at like focus at one vessel, um, but it requires very high sampling rate and accurate measurement of time. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but if yes. that can, be done, then uh, of course it's also more variable and mobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yu Wang, Yu Wang Hu, how are you? Hey, good. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Yun Gang, for the uh, nice talk. I feel your talk is always very transparent and educational. I enjoy oh, it you. a lot. Yeah, so uh, my question is. Uh, uh, have you uh, thought about uh, the effect or have any comments on the effect of viscoelastic behavior of artery to this behavior? What's the time scale of the flow comparing with the, the time scale of the material? Uh, um, uh, uh, do you have, uh, uh, do you know uh, in literature how much people know about this uh, viscoelasticity of uh, uh, arteries uh, materials? Oh, uh, uh, very good question. Um, there are a lot of literature data reporting. Some say strong effects, some do not. But for us, we uh, this viscoelasticity will make this formula much, much more complex than we ha current have, we, than we can handle. So right now, we have not accounted for the effect of viscoelasticity at all. But for that uh, in vitro experiment, in vitro experiment, that's a, that's a PDMS2. That one we actually, uh, in the experiment part, we 
choose some material that distribute very little after processing very little viscoelastic effect for, for that linear. But for, for human artery, we don't have a good answer for the effect of viscoelasticity. And you know, some is discussed in YC Feng's book, but still they use a hyperelastic potential. So along the line of that, we have a question from a panelist that says, um, Fung's constitutive model does not consider, I'm sorry, in the chat, Fung's constitutive model does not consider the multi-layer structure and oriented fibers of arterial walls. Do you think whether those factors will impact the accuracy of your model or not? Um, yeah, those can certainly impact the model, but it's really a trade-off between how accurate you want and how simple you want. If we account for all those features, I guarantee we won't be able to reach any simple formula. It will be too complex. So right now, our strategy is develop something and, and try to have two simple parameters, alpha, beta, and do a lot of tests with, med, uh, with medical doctor to see whether those can characterize well. If that, that still cannot characterize, we'll, we may be forced to proceed to account for all those details. But right now, accounting for those details would be too much uh, or too difficult for, for, for analytical modeling, I think. Um, hi, Sean. Uh, hi, Chow. I'm sorry, I keep on mis mispronouncing yeah, I can, your name. Uh, comment support uh, uh, Dr. Huang's point. Because the uh, phone model, you know, you look at the overall, when you consider detailed structure, you, if you look at the local property, some behave, you know, the local detail is important. But for overall description, uh, describe the behave, I think the without considering the three layer, you know, it's fine you, for your overall uh, pulse wave stuff. So I think it is fine. Uh, actually, I have another question. Uh, Thank you. When you look at uh, your alpha beta, I think, you know, um, you know, it's important to know what's affecting the alpha beta. So, you know, then when I go home, right? So I know in this situation, I should recalibrate my alpha beta or maybe the others, I don't. So I think it will be helpful if we can, uh, you can kind of look at the detail. You're, you have the, all this uh, complicated equation, say which parameter are affecting the alpha beta. So you know what you should be looking for when you need to recalibrate uh, alpha beta. For example, I think uh, you drop the P over C term. Yes. And how the C may affect your alpha beta. So that's somehow theoretically, I think you can do complicated very, yeah. very good suggestion. Very good suggestion. Very good suggestion. We haven't done that yet, but uh, I can answer quickly that uh, this uh, alpha depends strongly on this uh, um, this uh, uh, parameter A1 in the constant model. If you look at the equation, I dropped this log term that uh, A1 still shows up. So this alpha depends strongly on some constant model and the beta depends strongly on the, the term I dropped, that is the C and, and other sickness. Term. So yeah, that's, that's an really excellent really point. Very useful for user, you know, to actually- yeah. Very good point, very good point. We, 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 will, we will do, thank you for this very, uh, very nice suggestion. We'll, we'll do some study on those. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have Glossio Polino who would like to ask a question, Glossio. You need to unmute, Glaucio. All right, is it okay now? Yes, it yes. is. All right, uh, thank you, Vicky. Uh, hello, Yongang. Uh, thanks Hi. for the very nice talk, very informative, uh, very interesting. Thank you. And uh, actually, your talk uh, reminds me of a TED lecture by Murray Gelman, where uh, he said that uh, elegant equations are more likely to be right than uh, equations that are not elegant. And I appreciate the elegance in your uh, presentation and derivations. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, Jung, I also agree that uh, probably, of course, uh, if you try to do, uh, let's say a multi-scale approach and uh, go down all the scales and uh, modeling uh, all the details of all the layers of, uh, the arteries and uh, the constituents of uh, the blood and so on, I think uh, the work would lose the appeal that uh, you have to make it applicable uh, in the uh, medical field. 
my uh, my main question is uh, are you guys thinking to translate uh, some of these uh, to other animals for example the, the for example like uh, pets uh, for example sometimes they also suffer uh, did you try this in animals or uh, only in humans so far oh uh yeah, uh, I, I, I'm a mechanics person and, and I leave this uh, trying part to John and he actually has uh, <laughs> a lot of manpower and also a startup companies to, to explore this further. But, but, but for us, uh, I think my part so far stopped. We've showed the formula how this can be used and further development uh, maybe up to other people to follow up. Uh, but of course, we, we do have patents for this. We do have patents for this. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Glossy. Um, let me take this opportunity to ask uh, maybe a broader question. I think one of the big issues in biomechanics or tissue mechanics um, is measuring stiffness, right? So uh, there's a lot of diseases that are related to the stiffness of the tissue and the tissue system that I work with, certainly we're always concerned with how to measure stiffness and how to modify stiffness to, to affect cellular behavior. Have you thought about um, using similar techniques to and similar models to maybe estimate the stiffness of arteries? I mean, that can be very important, especially for certain pathological conditions like um, AAA, um, um, aortic artery, um, and I mean, aneurysms, or, you know, even looking at stiffened arteries uh, because of diabetic um, uh, issues. Um, can you use similar measurements and just do an inverse analysis to, to get at, at modules? Yeah. yeah, excellent point. In fact, uh, uh, by doing this analysis, if we can get uh, the uh, alpha beta correctly, then we can try to uh, get the, if you remember the curve I showed, I, on, uh, I showed the pressure versus pulse wave speed. I also show the Young's model, which is pulse wave speed. So, so there's some correlation here. But our thinking is that um, we haven't put this into action yet. But our thinking is that uh, for a person, um, basically, over, over a certain period of time, if alpha and beta <coughs> changes, and those could very well reflect the changes in the material property. Because in general, uh, the, the radius does not change that much. The thickness may, for example, people have different, yeah. So if there's a way to detect the thickness change some way, then one can correlate the uh, Young's modulus change, stiffness change. So uh, uh, I can put this one, if you don't care about Young's modulus, if you only care about stiffness, which is Young's modulus times eight, then that's really great because this one correlates. You can think of it's tens of volts, mainly stretching. So it's mainly stretch. So this one, alpha and beta, will be more related to, will be dominated by E times H. If A times H changes, then this alpha beta should change. Yeah, I mean, in both cases, in remodeling, uh, unfortunately, both remodel, right? The, uh, the, the thickness of the artery and also the stiffness of the arteries, and they can indicate slightly different things. But I think in, in yep. for that application, it's really important to, to determine carefully what are the factors that affect your alpha and beta. Um, yeah, yeah. This is why Professor Han's suggestion is really important to study yeah. what does what do alpha and beta depend on? And when we figure out if alpha and beta changes, we can infer what uh, what material properties, what uh, properties have been changed. I think one thing that we find very challenging in my uh, my lab and the area that I work on is that the human variation is so huge, right? It's yeah. like, yeah. It, it really is. Even if you measure thickness, it's just boom, big spread. Yeah. Um, so it, I, it, can you talk about, comment on that and, and what are some engineering strategies that one can use to, um, to deal with, with um, this kind of variability to make what your your empirical relation to be useful in that in, 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 with, with that inherent variability? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely a uh, uh, lot of uh, large uh, variability, but, but if the same person, same location, uh, there shouldn't, not, at the same designated location, there should not be a huge change unless 
the uh, person's health state changes. If you can precisely put on one location, consider measure the same location, one should get the same alpha and beta unless this alpha uh, mature property changes. This is our belief. Of course, we still need to test this further. Uh, uh, Jimmy. Uh, Jim Shah, I think you have your hands up. Sure. Yeah, uh, related question to Vicky's and to uh, High Charles. Uh, if you test a particular location mm -hmm. of a group of people and you can calibrate the alpha and beta for, for a large group of people, maybe you can find some uh, trend of this for example, value of alpha and value of beta, or maybe the ratio of these things. I know you haven't done that, but uh, uh, maybe the benefit of this is uh, one of the major things for heart disease is the blockage of artery. The blockage of artery is a sudden change of the diameter of, of that uh, pipe, right? And if you have that information, that the uh, alpha beta, beta for regular people, let's say there is a range for that, and you consistently test and find that this person has a very different alpha and beta, maybe that's an indication, going back to Vicky's question, it, it could either be a change of the tissue stiffness, you know, the blood vessel tissue stiffness, or maybe a change of configuration, maybe an indication of a heart disease. So these are things that I think the, the model is very interesting. If you use it to test many patients, there may be uh, all kinds of new things that you can try yeah. to develop. Right. Excellent suggestions, excellent suggestions. Yeah. Uh, Tahir? Yeah, uh, this is getting more interesting than measuring blood pressures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think originating from uh, Franz Papen and then followed up by Ethan and then and Vicky and now now uh, Jimmy, it seems to me that if we think of having these parameters as a additional indicators of the health condition, then why just limit to two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe two could be limited to blood pressure measurements that gives us an immediate, you know, uh, the vital signs. But if it is two, three, four parameters, and maybe other indicators or other signals of the health state might be showing up. So, uh, because you could calculate or estimate the, if you have more parameters, it doesn't hurt because the model has them already and the sensors have the information already. So maybe a temporal change of those parameters. And I'm thinking of multi, multi-parameter, not just alpha beta, but maybe two others. Uh, and maybe asking the question, what do what those parameters really physically bio, or, or medically mean? Uh, physiologically, what do they mean? Uh, could be asked in a much more deeper way and may begin to reflect, may begin to show early warnings of what is to come. Uh, so we don't have to think about just minimizing the parameter space depending on the question we ask. So that's, that's the comment. Um, that's where mechanics can play a significant <coughs> role because they are coming from first principles. <coughs> yeah. Uh, or quote unquote first principles. Okay. But uh, it, it may give us some more insight that we, that we don't get just by measuring the blood pressure. Of course, blood pressure is an indicator of the health state. Uh, but as Vicky said that and many others suggested that, you know, the tissue stiffness, the blood, the, the um, atherosclerosis in the, in the arteries, all those things can begin to show up in those parameters. So this is fascinating avenue, I think, because of John's simple device and your model picks up some of the parameters that may have more health, uh, health indicators. So I'll stop. Yeah, excellent, excellent comments. I, I just want to point out, we did not limit ourselves to two parameters. We just want to solve the equation and find out how many we need. In the end, we find we only need two. It's not like we said we could have, we could have three, we throw away one. We just want to solve and end up with two. End up with two. Yeah. Uh, 
to, to measure the blood pressure only, right? Yes, to measure blood pressure. But there could be other things that one could definitely. Definitely. The data, data is already there. Definitely, definitely. It is already there. Definitely. Um, Taher, um, just, just a quick uh, answer to Taher's uh, comment. Uh, that's absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, uh, just the pulse wave velocity itself is a clinically widely used parameter uh, to infer artery stiffness and other cardiovascular risks without doing any um, manipulation of PWV. Just using PWV itself has been uh, clinically used. Just like pressure is important, PWV is also important. Right. Uh, we have a question from uh, Zhang Zhu. Hey, Yung Gang. Yeah, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Yung. And, and also very, very interesting discussions, which I think in the end comes down to, to your model and also the device. So I'm going to ask a question on the, on the device side. Right? You mentioned you use a patch to measure the PWV, right? because uh, then the distance between the two sides is very close. Then, so in other words, you need to have high accuracy in measuring the pulse waves. I think something in line with what the Nanshu mentioned earlier. So, uh, so what method do you use to measure the pulse wave? Uh, oh. Some people use it like a street sensor, okay, uh, ultrasound. So what methods are you guys using to, to measure the pulse waves? Oh, oh, they have something, uh, uh, it's called a PPG inside the sensor. Basically that measures the, okay. You know, when the when it goes when the pressure wave comes, your blood uh, vessel expands, and that's a change the light reflection, and that can immediately detect that. So they, they actually they use a light to, to measure uh, based on the light deflect diffraction, they can measure the, the, the instant or time when the passes. I see. So you you are using the reflection mode of the. PPG because I think a lot of people use in the transmission mode of the PPG, uh, but that that will limit to to the fingertips. So PPG is typically put on the fingertips, but yeah. in your case it's reflective, so it can reflective. be anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Guy, I saw your hand go up. Do you have a question? I do. I, I have a virtual hand up. In fact, uh, the. So uh, uh, following up with uh, what with, with Jimmy and Howard were, were talking about, in terms of detecting something like uh, an accumulation of atherosclerotic plaques, some sort of blockage in the vasculature, in the context of your model, where, where you'd normally be, be measuring uh, blood pressure someplace other than uh, around, say, a bifurcation of an artery where, where we expect these plaques to accumulate dangerously, with, with, the, with these... Would, would, would a plaque show up as a change in the parameters, alpha and beta, uh, you know, local, say, if you're measuring on, on your arm, your hand, or would they show up as, as, a, as sort of a, a difference in the solution? It's kind of a boundary condition, it's a reflection of waves at some point. Uh, I'm not so sure I followed uh, your question on the reflection. Are you talking about uh, whether the Due to complex geometry, you can have wave reflexing or branching. So, the, so more, more simply, the question is, if, if you want to detect whether or not a patient is about to have an atherosclerotic plaque that shoots up to the brain and gives them a stroke, then, 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 uh, then would that show up as a change in, in alpha and beta? Or would that show up as, as some sort of change to the waveform instead? Oh, both are important. But, but, but waveforms, I, I see both, both are important. Both are important. Both are important. And, and yeah, and uh, alpha beta only reflect the blood pressure, uh, related blood pressure measurement, but waveform is also critically important. But that can be obtained from ECG, right? The, the electrical one can, the pressure one can't. Okay. Electrical and pressure waves are, are decoupled. Uh, they're related, but, uh, but anyway, I, I think there's utility here for that. Delighted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that question, but I, I know this is an important one, but I don't have the answer to, to that question. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Chang Zhu Mao. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a question. Uh, because as you know, the vessel is embedded in the uh, body tissue. So will the body tissue surrounding the vessel will challenge your model? Yeah. Yeah. Because as you know, you said that the diameter, uh, diameter of the vessel will will double yeah, yeah. or even triple. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah. That is actually the assumption in the Bramhill equation, even before MK, when they do the fluid analysis, fluid mechanics analysis, uh, they assume this uh, blood vessel is freestanding. And that is a part, that's certainly an assumption. And, and that, but that is part of, we didn't touch, we didn't touch that part. And they, they do that because, you know, again, if you account for the fluid solid interaction, the model becomes very complex. And, and uh, however, that can be just uh, very well justified. Uh, you know, typically between the blood vessel and the tissue, it's not necessarily always tight. It's always a little uh, room for the blood vessel to expand. So that 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 is not too bad an assumption. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Shangha. Hey, hey, Vicky. Hey, Yunga. Hello, hey, everyone. Uh, so uh, Shanghai Zhao from IIT. Uh, so uh, I truly enjoy this Gordon Research Conference every week. Uh, so uh, great talk, you got, uh, as always, right? Uh, now uh, I, I just want to make two comments and then uh, to see your uh, you know uh, to see your feedback on these comments. Uh, I see the uh, this uh, the value of this kind of very uh, detailed model uh, of uh, you know either device or measurement of human body. There are at least two values. Uh, number one. Uh, now, uh, with this model, so uh, when patient goes in, patients still need to do one calibration with a traditional blood pressure measurement. And then this device coupled with the model uh, can give the patient long-term continuous measurement. So that's uh, one value I see, uh, you know, uh, with this uh, model. Uh, then the second one, actually, uh, you know, we've been discussing this, I see this prob potentially more profound uh, traditional models, right, you uh, rely on empirical uh, equations. Uh, they really do not give you too much insights uh, about the physiological condition, you know, what's the, uh, you know, pathology, what's the disease lead to certain signal. But uh, with this kind of a detailed model, now with the signal you measure, uh, you, uh, people can begin to understand, can uh, go back to understand what's the physiological condition, what is the, really the cause of those diseases. And then by uh, analyzing large population of uh, people, uh, this may potentially lead to you know, a very meaningful understanding. And especially coupled with a future measurement, uh, really give people uh, many, many uh, insights and uh, eventually prevention uh, your measure. You got, I want to see your uh, you know, feedback or uh, comments on this. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't have much feedback. You already said this very well. Uh, indeed, we just feel that uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't have much feedback. I just, but I want to point out one thing that uh, when we collaborate with people in different fields, especially in medicine, uh, personally, I feel that, that the simplicity is very important. Uh, if you get something uh, too complex, uh, they will not use it. So, so my view is that uh, uh, we need to do mechanics accurately, but we also need to in the end, make it simple. This is just one example I want to show that we try to make it simple to, uh, for that to work. But, uh, but uh, oh, the others, I, I don't have comments. I think you, you said very well. Yeah, I, I want to, I think um, I've also found that um, in, in, in working in, with, bio, with doctors and, and biomedical engineers, and, and I'm, I'm sure this applies to all fields that we interact with in mechanics, um, if you want to apply what you're doing and you want people to, to use it, it's best to, to reduce down to the most essential elements, right? So if you don't need nonlinear elasticity, do not use nonlinear elasticity. Um, if you don't need orthotropy, do not use orthotropy. It's, um, and um, mainly one of the reasons is, is not just the communication with people in other fields, but it's, it's also the data is so messy. Because the data is so messy, it's, and you have, 10 different parameters, you're not really quite sure if you're fitting noise at some point, right? So statistics become really important, at, at, but at, at the same time, you should just be as reductionist as you can and then build up from there. Once you have 
layers of confidence, um, then you can add complexity. At least that's been my experience. So, so it's my comment. Jigong, you have your hands up. So yeah, this is a wonderful discussion, uh, Yunggang. Thank you so much. Thank you. To bring back uh, the fund of mechanics. Wonderful. Now, but I want to go to uh, the other direction because uh, John and you have uh, pushing that frontier of doing uh, lots of measurement, not just pr blood pressure, right? You measure many, many things. So every time I uh, go with my wife to the hospital now, very often, doctors, not doctors, nurse measure large table of values. Then I watch my her doctor to use these values. Oh, this value, uh, some some uh, uh, B twelve or something. They treat it just like piece of trash. So there, as far as I know, most data are unused. Now, of course, we all heard this wonderful news of future that uh, uh, big data will uh, turn into to a smart and big decision. So from your perspective with John, interacting with uh, people at the frontier of medicine, uh, is that coming or will that come at some point? Using massive data to make useful decisions. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, neither Jiang nor I are computational scientists. Now, I'm a modeler, Jiang, um, Jiang's everywhere, but, 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 uh, 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 but from our discussions, from our interactions, this big data is certainly very important. Mm -hmm. But the more important thing is that you need to show the doctors to convince them how those can be used. Otherwise, I mean, if you just provide them the data and, 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 and not uh, picking them, not showing them uh, which set of parameters are critical for certain things, they are not going to use it. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. The other things that, uh, you know, in some, lot of, there are a lot of times, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they cannot even quantify things. For example, uh, uh, for COVID-19, people say, oh, coughing, coughing is too often. How often is too often? How do you measure that? Right? I mean, uh, and, 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 you know, so there are a lot of things uh, uh, in the medicine. I mean, in other words, they, they need more quantitative science. They mo need more quantitative science. And I'm not sure I provide the answer you need or you, you ask, but, but certainly if we provide more quantitative data and show them the most important, show them how to use, mm -hmm. then that, that, that then become useful. Because they always have, for example, 14 parameters. If you add one more parameters, or if you, they, they are not going to be impressed. But if you show this single parameter by doing this way, can tell what they they immediately jump on the wagon. Thank you. So, so I, I, I had some. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shigan. Yeah. Can I ask the uh, uh, same question to people? I know people in the uh, in this on this screen have uh, extensive uh, interaction with uh, doctors or or a medical scientist, Xuan uh, He, in your interaction with people, people must keep talking about this, right? But what is your sense of the reality of this using big data to do something real in medical uh, medicine? Well, uh, I can give some examples. For example, Apple Watch now can use uh, this uh, big data measurement of uh, uh, ECG uh, to predict you know, abnormal, uh, this uh, AF, uh, you know, I forgot the whole word. So, so, so uh, pe pe people uh, begin to, uh, you know, harness this. Uh, but I guess, Jigang, your question is, you know, currently probably clinicians only identify the abnormal data point. And then for many normal data point, they just, well, it's normal. We don't need to use it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anymore. So uh, how to harness that power uh, I don't know, hard to predict, but uh, if there is, a, so I, I, I still think uh, the power of model is, uh, you know, really connect data to some insight, you know, can be very simple model, but, uh, you know, if you can, uh, you know, develop some relation, then with this data, you can, you know, tell people, uh, you know, uh, what's the trend and some understanding. So that's my, uh, you know, 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, so in my field, which is ophthalmology, uh, AI is, is being harnessed to analyze just a ginormous database of images to detect things like uh, AMD, glaucoma, abnormal images of your optic structures. So here's some issues, um, at least in my field, that, that is being faced. One, the measurement devices are still not great. So um, you, know, you, you still have challenges in the images are not, they're noisy, they're shadowed by blood vessels. So there's still that challenge is that the data is not that good. So uh, it's not quite there yet. So there's a lot of computational models that are, are being used. A uh, mechanic is actually being used to, um, to predict what these structures may look like under various rotations, affine motions. So to augment um, that database so they can do better predictions. Number two, it's still a big correlation, right? So yes, you can correlate various images with probabilities of, of, of damage or risk factors of damage, but uh, you still run into the problem of there's a really large variation of um, conditions. So what may be normal in somebody may not be normal in another person. Um, so there's imaging devices that are being built in that for example, take an image of your retinal nerve fiber layer and they say, well, this thickness, it's, a little, it's too thin, therefore you're at, at risk for glaucoma. Uh, but that, that is, that is, a, that is a, a risk factor that is not predictive, right? It, you still require uh, physicians to go in and, and, and do more detailed visual field analysis and visual field testing to say, yes, that looks like you've got glaucoma. There's no, di there's no definitive molecular marker for this. Um, and so that doctors are still required. But I think the use there is that it, it, it flags more cases um, it flags those particularly troubling cases that for doctors to, to focus on, and it, it, may, it reduces the amount of things that they have to look at. And I can think that's, that's the, one of the useful idea, uh, things. And number three, again, it is- I can give Jugal one more example about big data. So there is a thermometer company called Kinza, and they are just uh, digital smart thermometers that can uh, upload um, uh, customer temperature to the cloud. And they predicted the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in the US in February because they saw a, an increase of the population temperature. Hmm. And they can even identify like the uh, um, epidemic because they know the distribution of those population. So Tang, you also had your hand up for an example, I'm guessing? Yeah, uh, I don't really have an example because I don't work with uh, doctors directly, but I have uh, many doctors in my families. Uh, my grandpa was uh, uh, practicing Chinese medicine uh, many, many years when in his days. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, traditional Chinese medicine, you know how um, powerful those very seasoned experienced uh, doctors then by touching your pulses, they can learn a lot of things and do diagnosis and um, follow up uh, treatment as well. Uh, so uh, getting back to Ji Gang's uh, question, I think what is missing here, uh, uh, actually, uh, 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 Yung Gang, you mentioned this very clearly that uh, you have this data, right? Measurement, you have the uh, very nice model, very elegant model and uh, the test data but the problem is you need to convince the doctors to read this data and to use this data or correlate this data with their diagnosis. So Jigong mentioned that, okay, uh, when you go to the hospital, the nurses, they, they have a lot of data uh, mirrored, right? And probably the doctor, you feel that the doctor uh, are not really reading those data, but it's also possible that after many, many years of practicing, uh, practicing the doctors can quickly uh, glimpse through the data and uh, make certain decisions. That is the missing link, actually, because for the big data to work, for the machine learning model to work, you need to have this training set of data and also the testing set of data. So currently in this process, there was a missing link. So you don't really have a good training data. So for example, the training data could be uh, the data measured by uh, Yung Gang and the John Rogers group and the model, and then you need to correlate this with the diagnosis, which is provided by the doctor. And now you and we're waiting or we need really someone 
can talk both languages and convince the both sides to talk to each other, to connect the dots. And then this connection will be the input to train the machine, mo machine learning model, the, the, the model to make the predictions. Otherwise, uh, this won't work. So that's my two cents about this. Uh, Bao Xing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Huang, for the uh, very nice uh, talk. So uh, from a very complicated biomedical, uh, the, the problems to a very beautiful the mechanics, the model. So uh, one quick question is maybe uh, your research is motivated by the measurement of the uh, PVW, uh, so for the uh, uh, blood vessel. So um, question is, but for general, if you just say, uh, you also mentioned it, uh, uh, when people cough. So is the cough is maybe is not, uh, first of all, a model is uh, say the deformation of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the venery to, to the, uh, the, the blood. So if you change the blood to a uh, gas, so uh, when you measure the cough, uh, as far as I know, currently for the measurement of the cough is maybe measure the ECG. So uh, I'm wondering whether you can also measure the, the uh, gas flow or from the body or some, uh, when you breath. So, uh, and also your mechanics model can hold uh, or, uh, or any sort of other uh, change. So for example, you give this uh, PWV, uh, the model is uh, uh, the power law or you uh, uh, think uh, you also change alpha beta and then just, uh, just my uh, the question is beyond maybe the measurement of the blood cell. So how about for, for other different, uh, this non-solid just for the liquid for the gas. So thank you. It, it, uh, very good, very good question. Uh, we have just started the thinking about those. We have not really made much progress yet. But the thing is that the, the reason I mentioned cough, uh, uh, John talked to medical doctors. And, and uh, in, in, in medicine, now there's not a quantitative way to characterize how, how frequent people cough. For example, you see this patient, he coughs a lot. What, what, what a lot is a lot? How do you record that? So there are a lot of things which, you know, uh, on one hand, we have a lot of, you know, like Jigong mentioned, data mining, a lot of data exists. How do you use that? But on the other hand, there are also some fundamental questions people don't know how to measure, or people in medicine don't know how to measure yet. Right? For, yeah, for, for coronavirus, this coughing is important, but how do you characterize? How do you, yeah, how can we just characterize? Even in the hospital, it's only based on nurse. The nurse, oh, this costs a lot. Uh, there's no, no quantitative measurement for that. That's the reason I brought this up. I, I'm just saying, as compared to mechanics, medicine is, uh, uh, yeah, it still has a, a long way to go in terms of quantitative of many things. I th I'm, I'm thinking uh, before people can uh, start to cough, there may be some change of the uh, of, of your lung, uh, the breathing. Uh, if you can catch a very small uh, the change before people start to cough, from yeah. mechanical point of view, then I think that that, that, may... that that could could be useful. That could be useful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I agree. I agree. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nanshu, yeah, you got time. your hands up. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. So uh, another uh, uh, comment and a question actually for Yonggang is that, um, so uh, we did some tests for multiple subjects um, using our chest patch, not the um, pulse wave velocity, but we measure the systole, heartbeat, heart contraction time. And we found out that the correlation uh, for is uh, uh, the R value could be from uh, 0 0.7 to 0 0.95. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when we um, aggregate four subjects data, uh, we found that the systolic blood pressure correlation R value drops to 0 0.64. Mm -hmm. And the diastolic blood pressure mm -hmm. correlation drops to 0.17 for four mm -hmm. subjects. So uh, one question for Yonggang is, um, how do you differentiate uh, systolic and diastolic um, blood pressure uh, using your model and whether you have uh, found a significantly different correlation, even just for one subject? Oh, very good question, very good. The model uh, right now works best for the uh, diastolic pressure. <laughs> It works back for diastolic pressure. The reason is that um, 
at the systolic pressure, the pressure is large, then the waveform deforms. So it's not as accurate for determining the peak peak time as compared to foot to foot time. So this works for best for diastolic, uh, diastolic, diastolic pressure, but not as good for systolic. For systolic, there are some other ways we can compensate. For example, uh, for example, to get from the waveform, we can get some compensation. But right now, this works for uh, uh, right now this works for mainly the diastolic pressure. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions, Jigang? Yeah, uh, Yunggang, uh, and also uh, other people. So I see a number of people have been thinking about a similar questions. Uh, now, here's a, uh, in your talk, you refer to a uh, certain kind of measurement, mostly patch through the skin. So that's probably easiest to implement. But I know John and you and others here also interested in uh, thinking about inside body measurement. You can mm -hmm. uh, take blood. Uh, you can take a blood, but that requires you take blood. And, if you have a device, already many devices are implanted inside body. Right now, most of these devices don't even take any measurement. For example, stent doesn't take any measurement. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys and other people think about in developing the in-body measurement sensors? Uh, what are the challenges? What are the recent uh, developments? Oh. Yeah, um, the, for those uh, in, implant devices, it takes a lot, lot, lot more effort yeah. than the, those on the skin. Yeah. So um, certainly, you know, that uh, also that requires a lot longer approval from all the IRB and all these things. So there are certainly uh, efforts doing that, but we, we find, at least uh, my understanding of John's lab, uh, focusing on skin measurement and get important data is probably the, might be the best approach right now. I mean, to do the implant, it's, it's important, but it might be for a longer term, mm. might be for a longer term. That's important, certainly, but, but also, Implant, there are a lot of other issues. Um, for you, know, you have a device inside, how do you take the device out, how do you change, there, there are a lot of issues. So most of our project right now are ongoing um, surface related, skin surface, skin related. So for those, uh, uh, I mean, John's group does work with uh, people, for example, on heart, on brain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but those one, I said, has a longer distance from, Real applications in to human body. It's more on research. A specific example in, uh, in mind because uh, many uh, things are already implanted into people. Stent is one example. Mm -hmm. Are according to a certain statistics, as people grow older, large portion of population will have stent in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. At this moment, stent take no measurement. Yeah, yeah. But a big piece of metal inside body doesn't do any measurement. Yeah. Uh, I fully agree. Fully. But, but however, if one decide to put stent to have certain functions, yeah. that is entirely a new game. They didn't need approval from the from the bottom, right? It's yeah. a start over. That's need to start over. Yeah. And typically, it's really take many, many, many years to get those approved. Okay. It's just that the, you know, which can, yeah. which one is easier? It's important to make an impact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Xianghe and Nanshu, you, you guys must have a lot of experience, at least thinking about these things. A any, any, anything to add, Xianghe? We are doing, uh, so uh, I would say fundamental research uh, for uh, implanting uh, devices into the body. As Jigang mentioned, nowadays, uh, most of them are a big piece of uh, metal or rigid plastic. Uh, can we design, uh, you know, uh, soft materials with similar properties as uh, tissues, but uh, can be long lasting in the body for a few years even. Uh, so uh, it's uh, really uh, fundamental research. I would say uh, if we want to do, we also do some translational work. 
but the translational work will be very, very simple. For example, just a bioadhesive uh, without a sensor whatsoever, just to seal certain wound, certain type of wound. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, then for far reaching, uh, you know, uh, investigation is more research mode uh, instead of thinking about a, a translation, uh, you know, translation probably is really down, down the road. So there are still lots of research required for even just fundamental uh, material device fabrication. Yeah. Thank you. Wow, this is a status. Wow. Yeah, I, I also want to add that um, going from non-invasive to invasive is a complete game changing um, thing. And um, there are a lot of challenges uh, on like three um, uh, aspects. First, uh, we always have to consider uh, biocompatibility, uh, especially uh, long-term implantables like uh, brain implantables, heart implantables. Yeah. And um, second, and, and also those uh, biochemical um, uh, reactions. And second is the, on the device side, um, how to um, properly encapsulate on the device uh, from uh, um, like shortening or even shocking the um, biological um, tissue. And uh, the third one is uh, like what Stephanie mentioned, the reproducibility of the devices. Mm -hmm. If we're doing lab work and um, uh, there is always batch to batch difference and that can uh, vary the results significantly. So that's why I am not working on um, implantables in my group at UT Austin, but I worked on those when I was postdoc in John's group and I am still collaborating with uh, Professor Daehyung Kim at Seoul National University. And um, when we are talking about translational uh, sensor work, it, it's always a massive uh, uh, efforts, long time, multiple uh, participants like this. Yeah, it, usually in, in those, applications details matter a lot and the details mm -hmm. are complicated mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in some way that's it's, and uh, that's different than way the way we think in mechanics we really like to simplify and reduce and and have some elegance to what we do but a lot of practical biomedical applications details are dirty and they matter mm -hmm. yeah. do you have any other questions all right do we have any, any students? I, I sent out a, a chat to students to see if they, they want to have this opportunity to ask Professor Wong any, any question. It does not have to be technical. My students said their questions are already asked. Ah. Oh, great. Excellent. Uh, Bin Lu? Yeah. Uh, Professor Huang, uh, thank Hi. you. Awesome, very wonderful talk and a very wonderful example to how to get a simple equation for this so complex problem. But my question is about uh, you show the comparison your model with uh, experimental data, uh, the, the figure between the pressure versus the PWV. Yeah. <sighs> I, I saw that uh, there are a lot of scattering of this uh, experimental data. So even you can measure the PW very accurately, maybe you still can have some error in measuring the pressure. So I, I, I'm not sure if, if this error is acceptable for the medical uh, practice. Yeah, uh, 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 excellent question. Uh, uh, indeed, when we search the literature data, when we plot mm -hmm. the PWV mm -hmm. uh, pressure, blood pressure versus PWV, for the same mm -hmm. person, we see a big scattering. I mean, it's not like a nice curve. It's really a lot of scattering. Mm -hmm. So we wonder that, you know, if it's such a scattering, what, how is that useful? Well, uh, blood pressure is still the way uh, uh, we call it golden standard. Uh, uh, gold standard uh, used in medicine to, to monitor people's heart. Uh, this is why we think that if we focus too much on blood pressure and the scattering is really huge, but if over long term, if we can monitor 
this alpha and beta to see whether there's a consistent change in alpha and beta, that might be more important to characterize the person's health. You know, for the same person, the blood pressure during the day can change, as I showed, it can change substantially. It's like a variable can change substantially. Mm -hmm. If you keep mm -hmm. doing blood pressure, you, you, you are not going to get one data point anyway. So mm -hmm. this is why we are thinking this alpha beta, if that can be proven uh, to have a good correlation, that be, might be more important to tell this person, to tell this mm -hmm. person's general health is ch has changed or not. Okay, thank you. Jigang. Oh, okay. Yunggang, uh, since Vicky uh, uh, invited us to ask more general question, uh, there's one particular question you will answer. Just, uh, you have been over the years uh, been doing quite a few outstanding and important down to earth problems in mechanics. Thank you. They provide yet another example, right? Thank so you. Uh, now how do you really think about it? Because uh, when you and I started as a young professor, so there were also esoteric multi-scale modeling. You know? uh, so you, you yourself were involved in graphene, uh, these things. So by comparison, uh, you know, uh, down to earth research, important and also very imaginative, uh, but mostly useless stuff uh, in hindsight. But how do you think about these things after so many years? Uh, to be very frank and to be honest, I feel that uh, pursuit of those hot area is, is, I mean, at least for me, pursuit of those hot areas is a mistake for me. For example, when, when nano, became very hot in the early 2000s. And I went there, I jumped in, I published quite a paper, some very good citations close to 2000. But in the end, when, when I look back, what I did, I find what I did, you know, uh, probably people in physics can also do it. Uh, some, I, 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 I did some nice work, but I may not be unique. So I really want to find something I can be unique. I mean, very few people can do it. I know for sure Chikang can do it. Uh, uh, and Hua Jian can do it, and, and but but I want to find those problems that I can make a contribution that uh, 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 when not so many others uh, can do it or, or or cares to do it, then then that's that's uh, that's what I find important. Mm -hmm. So what in in the end I. Uh, uh, in the beginning, I could say I was still money driven. When Nano, there was a lot of funding I pursued Nano, but in the end, I find that's not the right way. I, I become either problem driven or skill driven. Problem driven, like Nano indentation, is the important problem. There was some science effect that cannot be expanded. So that needs new theory, and I, I jumped in. I, I like to. That's that's problem driven, and or skill driven is something that you know, like this problem, is pretty complex equation. But how to get to simple solutions? That's why I find the skill I I I learned from Harvard was very useful. So I like to pick the either skill-driven or problem-driven problems, but not money-driven problems. And, and also, I also find that uh, uh, it's really important to sometime to let go. And I, I was very happy in Champagne. I had five, six grants, lots of funding, doing lots of different things. But but when I find that uh, when I started collaboration with uh, Zhang, and I stop all this fund. I don't want the funding to be renewed anymore. I, I just want to focus on the things I can. You know. So I find that yeah, not 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 to pursue funding might be might at least works for me. I do it works for me. Vicky, Vicky, you're you're mute. I, I want to open up on that, that question to all the other people on this panel. Um, would you like to contribute to some of your insights to uh, younger investigators? Klausio, you always have a lot of ideas. Uh, Klausio, you all, you did the same thing to me that I'm doing. You, you need to unmute yourself. Klausio, you mute. You said you mute. Klausio, you are mute. You're muted. All right. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, I I would like uh, to pose the question also back uh, to you guys and uh, to the panel. Uh, something that. Uh, Again, inspired by your question, Zigang, uh, something that uh, bothers me a lot. Uh, I see, for example, 
uh, at the universities, we hire very bright assistant professors and uh, because they are the future, right? We, we are more senior, right? Uh, uh, the, the young uh, assistant professors, they are the future. But then uh, we have uh, the tenure system. And then uh, when I see those very bright people working in very safe problems, no professor, I have to have 20. Someone told me I have to have 20. I have to have 30 papers by the time I go for tenure. I say, why not one? <laughs> I, I prefer one. But, but then uh, I also understand. They tell me if I do one, uh, I'll be fired. But then, uh, for example, how can we put it all together? Uh, what you asked Zigang and what uh, Yong Gang just said, sometimes you, you have to let go uh, and then uh, identify what is the most exciting, uh, most challenge where you can have an impact and uh, go for it. How, how can we do that? I have a question about that. How can we do that? So if I may make a comment, do you hear me? Yep. Yes. I, I mean, this is, uh, uh, Jigang, you raised such an important question. And I think I, I, I look at you and Yong Hang, uh, Yong Hang Wang and many others as my mentors, my guides, uh, <clears throat> role models. Uh, but this is a problem, I think, uh, in academics. Um, I, I give one example, um, and this may or may not be relevant. So when I was interviewing at Illinois, our dean was Dean Schwalter. Uh, many of you may know, a very well-known fluid mechanician at the time. And so when I interviewed him, um, by that time I had interviewed other places, and most of the time Dean would tell me, you know, so-and-so got $2 million in the first two years. Uh, <laughs> and so I was very nervous. I got none of those jobs. <laughs> And I asked Dean Schalter after half an hour when he was, he had a small table and he had a piece of paper and he was telling me what he does. And he asked me what I do, very scientific. And when I was leaving, I asked him, Dean Schalter, what is your expectation from Illinois to get tenure? And he was a tall man. He looked at me, big smile. And he said, oh, I know you are, you are impatient. And I said, but I need to know. And he said, only one thing. And uh, I thought, oh, here comes 5 million now. Uh, but he said, if you are here for 10 years, and if I go anywhere in the world and give a talk, I would expect someone from the audience would come to me for a sabbatical at Illinois to learn from Tahir. That shook me because his idea was that a faculty member should be able to hold a body of knowledge that others can come to benefit from it. Others have the confidence that, oh, I can go to Jigang or I can go to Vicky and learn something from her. Anybody in the audience, not how many papers, not how many millions of dollars. I mean, these days it seems like more on the millions of dollars than number of papers. <laughs> uh, but I think that culture has changed. And I think what Galoshio said is, if it is one paper, I saw Vicky smiling. I don't think it's gonna work. I don't think so. I mean, I'm, I serve in the PNT. I write many letters and most of you do. One paper in six years, <laughs> it's too risky. So I, I, I has something to say. Turn, turn is now in the profession of uh, helping people now. <laughs> no, we are all in the position. Uh, this is what I what I call this uh, the best part of the EML webinar. And you know, it's as always, we keep the best part in the end. So uh, although we have a very long uh, recording, typically two hours, three hours, we're stretching to three hours. But uh, uh, I, I think this is the part that, uh, especially for younger people, um, shamelessly including myself, <laughs> enjoy uh, uh, a lot. I'm not offering uh, any solution or I just uh, I want to share some experience and comment uh, added to this discussion. Um, when I, so Jigan, you remember in 2006, you organized this Gordon conference in the thin film and the small scale mechanical properties. France, you were there and the France, thank you for being here. 
So uh, right after the Gordon conference, there was a flight waiting for me in Boston and heading to Maryland to start my assistant professor job. Friends, if you still remember, I actually asked you for surviving tips at the Gordon conference. So one thing friends told me, I remembered and uh, practiced actually a lot was uh, friends was straightforward and he told me, establish yourself. Uh, after six years or so, uh, you want to be Tang Li. You don't want to be another student of Ji Gang Su. <laughs> I rem remember that. And th I really thank you, uh, friends, for this advice. And uh, it's hard. It's not that easy. You know, uh, being a student of Ji Gang Su, I learned a lot and uh, I tried to practice this. And you know that uh, after that's about the time Qigong started to go soft, you know, <laughs> softer and softer and of course, recently, I mean, in terms of the research, soft materials. So I'm chasing the, 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 the hot area as, uh, as Yung Gang mentioned, I'm chasing the, 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 the hardest material or strongest material, graphene, <laughs> once I started my assistant uh, professorship uh, job. Uh, there are a lot of lessons and also learn something and some achievement as well. Um, I mean, the struggle we just had discussed, uh, especially for the assistant professor, uh, it's almost everywhere. Everyone in experienced the, the, the similar situation, uh, but uh, I managed to navigate it through the water. And the last week I was in a media interview and the, the interviewer was asking the similar question. Uh, she's a, 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 a host uh, uh, speaking Chinese, so he was asking that, is the research, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the assistant professor, uh, this uh, tenure system is the best system mm -hmm. for conducting research. So I think I shared the similar uh, viewpoint that it's, it's great to give you the very uh, freedom you want during that uh, six to eight years, but there are also many constraints over there, just like uh, Glossio mentioned over there, okay? People trying to be safe because this is a one-way you know, route. You want to go through. You don't want to be stopped uh, anywhere. So people trying to play the balance between being safe and also being creative. Um, I mean, that's the situation we are facing. I, I, so. I, I've been a mentor. I, I am mentoring uh, many young faculty at, at Hopkins. And I also get, always get the, the same question the first time we meet, which is, how do I get tenure? And I give the same answer, and I hope it's not too naive an answer in the day in this day and age. But it's, it's something that I've followed, which is choose a problem that you're really passionate about. If you're really passionate about it, you will make an impact mm -hmm. right, because you're a talented person. Um, and and if you make an impact, and and that means that you're going to want to share your results. That means you're going to want to publish. You're going to want to get funding so you can do what you want to do. Um, I I realize that may sound really naive. But I um, and I hope that is that is not. But I, I really do think that it's important for young people to to identify a, a problem or a set of problems or an area where they they really want to to work in that they're really passionate about. And and it's our job as more senior members of our field and our departments to to create an environment where they can do that. Um, we're not constantly telling them where is your ten papers. You know where is your where are your uh, DARPA grants. Uh, where's your um, Where's your nature paper? Um, I, I'm hoping that if you pursue your passion, those things will come. Hey, so I really like I really like Vicky's answer. I really like Vicky's answer. In, in fact, uh, yeah, that answer ensures that one continues to have passion to continue to have creativity mm -hmm. after tenure. If you just shoot for ten paper or something after tenure, then you may lose the creativity. You may lose the drive. But that's a passion is important. I fully agree. Hey, Franz, so those of you are teachers. Yeah, who are our teacher? You you have a <laughs> comment on if it's a longer career than all of us. Just yeah, uh, well, in terms of a, I, a I like problem. You know. The resonance that I've heard from what the you know the previous people mentioned, namely, you know, if you're going to do something, it must be something that you really are convinced is something you like that you think is important. And so if, if, if you're not convinced of it yourself, you're just doing it for the money. 
you know, you're going to get tired of it, right? So I think it's important that 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 you have a good concept in doing that, and indeed that it's your project, and that the world knows that it's your project, right? And uh, and that you conceived it and saw it through and all that. And I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, a couple couple of remarks in this in this respect. I mean, one problem, of course, that we're running into, and if if I look over, you know, 40, 50 years almost now universities have become a lot more bureaucratic and so as a result of that they use metrics of various kinds and and i think we should fight this at every point that we can i think this is really uh, goes against evaluating real talent i mean uh, counting papers is ridiculous reading papers that's what needs to be done and that takes work and takes judgment okay and so that's the sort of thing that uh, that we ought to convince our uh, superiors of that really ought to get done and so i think any, anyone here, if you can push back against this this increasing pressure from from what looks like ob objective measures, they're not. I mean, they're, 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 you can play games with those, right? It, it's much more important that people, you know, that uh, that uh, that good judgment is, is is formed in these things. Another uh, interesting analogy in all of this is, I think back to the old Bell Labs. Okay, you didn't have tenure at Bell Labs. You could get a very nice position there and all that. But still, you know, you didn't have teaching responsibilities and people there still, um, the, uh, the, the pressures were different. It was often not necessarily a very pleasant place because, uh, but, but it was a very productive place. It was a place where people were very creative people did many things. And so I think these sorts of institutions, uh, you know, they're very different from, uh, from, from, from our tenure steps. And, and yet they succeeded in bringing, uh, in producing people that were uh, stayed creative for many, many years. So, uh, of course, that was based in the case of Bell Labs because they had al almost infinite resources that they could uh, that they could go back to. And if you had an idea, you could very quickly make it uh, bring it to fruition. But I think uh, if we can create um, somehow, either through foundations or through change in university policies, ways of um, setting up our professors with more money that they can really dis dispense off in, in an independent way. I mean, it's nice actually that they get much more, much bigger startup packages now than they used to. I think that's a very good thing, but I think it should go even further. And I think in most cases, especially for experimentalists, uh, the tenure time should be a little longer. I think the, uh, the, to, to keep it too short is, uh, is one of the things that uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's of course, it creates more uncertainty, but at the same time, I think uh, uh, given uh, what, uh, what the work is like, especially for experimentalists, I think that would, that would not be a bad thing to do. But these are just some random thoughts. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you have been very quiet. You want to say something, Xi Xiao? <laughs> so this is from Tsinghua University. He will be our uh, future speaker. Just okay. now. Yeah, I, I appreciate the excellent talk of Yang Huang, which is really inspiring to me. And But I currently I have been listening to your questions and discussions, but I don't have any questions yet. Okay. Thank you. Because yeah. I have discussed this problem earlier with the Yang Huang. Yeah. Already. Okay. Yeah. I know this work very well. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Xi Xiao. No. Yeah. Jigan, yeah. what's your perspective on this question? Oh, it's hard. Uh, the other day, um, I was uh, actually, uh, Yong Gang is a world authority on this question <laughs> of collaboration. You are. You are, you're the most collaborative and most successful collaborator, supportive and also successful collaborator. The question was as following for young people. When I started uh, my job at UCSB, I wrote paper virtually with every senior faculty member. Um, so there was a, not a single person or suggestion that it might be a problem. So I never realized it was a problem. But nowadays, uh, many young people ask me the question, they're self-conscious. Should I collaborate with the senior researchers or not? Do I get penalized at the time of evaluation? Now, my own view is uh, I, when I collaborate with uh, Tony Evans, uh, David Clark, I learned a very long perspective. I'm almost like an extended postdoc. I have my, plenty of my time to do my own invention. 
right now there's is this is a their prime time if i can get their attention to talk to them it's wonderful uh but i i don't know if i can make this kind of uh suggestion uh responsibly to young people today yung gang how do you feel you are the world authority no 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 <laughs> about a collaboration you are yeah uh I really enjoy collaboration. I, I truly enjoy it. I mean, collaboration, through collaboration, I learn a lot. Uh, also, I become a better uh, one myself. Um, but these days, I have just very unfortunately, when a young assistant professor collaborates with a senior one, and, and, and in the promotion tenure committee, whom I have seen before, that uh, uh, which I have seen before that uh, people question whose idea is this? They always ask this question. It, it's it's very uh, discouraging. Mm -hmm. um, but but doesn't the uh, senior member then make the case? I mean, that, that seems to be. Uh, I agree with Shigang that you know working with senior people can be very productive, and and you have to bring something to the table. But I imagine the tenure discussions that the, the senior professor will clearly will speak up and say, look, this is so and so's contribution, and you know. He, he or she took advantage of what I had, had to offer here. And uh, so that's, uh, so do you think that's really a problem, Yong Gang, if it's done correctly, if in the tenure committee? No, within, within the same department, it might not be a problem because the senior professor could come up to, to exactly, yeah. really make it clear, right? But yeah, if in collaboration with someone sure. at another university, and, and, and for example, if one person is doing more modeling computation, the other doing experiments, that's very clear. But yeah. both people are doing modeling, doing the same line of work, then then this could be a problem. I mean, in some committees, this could be a problem because yeah. they, they could not really figure out whose idea or what the main contribution. Uh, uh, uh. So for me, I have also served uh, quite a few, uh, uh, men I have been a mentor for a young few young faculty members. And I, I told, what I told them is that if the, contribution can be clearly made, the distinction can be clear, it's not a problem. For example, one person is in my department, the other is in ECE, doing electronic work, it's not a problem. One person in my department, the other person is in another mechanical engineering, but doing one is experiment, one is modeling simulation, that's, that's fair. But if it's exactly the same line of work, uh, it's very unfortunate, but that reality, sometimes the person gets penalized. So my advice to them is that, uh, Try to get the tenure as fast as you can. Once you get tenure, don't don't be bothered by all these questions. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Although the, the drawback, of course, is if you do that, then that you will go for very safe problems, right? And then, so that uh, if if you really want to get tenure as quickly as possible, then then you start. Then you have to play the the, the short game, right? And uh, and I, I think. Um, yeah. I, I, I understand why why you say that, but uh, but I think I think it's best you know to have a good understanding that with the people that you that you work with, and certainly if if if, if you know them, that, that it can can happen almost without trying. That um, but but still, I I'd, I'd be reluctant to to tell someone to 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 just think about tenure. I I, I think the most important thing is to. Uh, in fact, certainly when when I came up as an assistant professor, Harvard was you know. It, people just left there and I had no illusions whatsoever. So I did decided just to do what I thought was good. And it, I got lucky or, or I was able to stay on. But I think it's, it's, it's good advice for people to, to do what really enthuses them, what keeps them going. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is a general question to the entire panel. Um, so I have never asked this question before about a running EML need to get some feedback uh, what to do, um, uh, the format, uh, even topics. So I guess uh, we're doing extreme mechanics. It's just so ill-defined what is extreme, how extreme you want to be. Uh, so uh, any, any thoughts? Uh, <laughs> um, looks like uh, we're going to uh, continue to do this uh, for, for quite a while now. Uh, before, let me interrupt. There's a, a YT from Hong Kong who'd like to ask a question. Okay. YT. 
Can you can you unmute? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, I really want to thank uh, Professor Huang for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it, enjoyed it very much. Very impressive. Thank you. And, and I also enjoyed uh, the conversation and the discussion. So let me first ask one, one question that have been bothering me for many years. And uh, we tried, you know, PPT and the BP. I'm sorry, we, ca we come back to the technical. And uh, because I first I was trying to ask a question, but I didn't have a chance. But uh, let me, because this question bothered me for many years. We, we, we tried the relationship between BP and PPT and the BP with the PWV and with many different relationships, even include the relationship you arrived, though we don't have a theory at the moment. What bothers us is that uh, when you immediately after the calibration, you do the test. No matter what the relation you have, linear, non-linear, quadratic, it's pretty good. I mean, the accuracy is okay. After the calibration, say for several hours, you do the testing, in particular the next day, none of them will work. None of them work, include the square, the one you just gave to us, unfortunately. So this is something we're trying to figure out. We still have no answer. I would like to ask either Professor Huang or anybody on the panel, what could be the reason for this kind of a problem. This is a problem we, we encountered for years. And this is the one reason we did announce, you know, complex BP will work. Because after the calibration, the calibration interval is very short for accuracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in this calibration, is, is there a way to, us, to assure that uh, we are calibrating the same point in the next day? We, we calibrate uh, like the equation you have the alpha and the beta. No, what I mean is in, that uh, in the experiment of calibration, you calibrate the one, one part of the arm for one part of the body. If in the next day, will that be the same part or the be Absolutely, absolutely. It's not only at the same part, the position and the time you will want to make. Say for example, you calibrate in the morning, and next day you test also in the morning. It's not going to work anymore. I'm not sure you tried this before, and we, we tried this many times, and no good luck. No any luck. I see. We have tried uh, the same person, same location, continuously for a few weeks. A few weeks. Same That's location. good to know. And we are able to get the same alpha and beta consistently. But, 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 but it's, it's really important to be the same location. Absolutely, that's definitely should be. That's good to know. You have that, that test already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to send uh, more details of our test to you to further discussion. But I think that at least- That's, that's really helpful. That's really helpful because we got some data from clinical, from patient, from normal. And you know, the first day is okay because when we run the data, we run several equations. Mm -hmm. It's like linear equation and your equation you just give to us, and other, you know, algorithm. But its main problem is that uh, the calibrated the parameter is not stable after the sec after the, you know certain period of time. Mm -hmm. So when we develop a couple SBP standard. And actually that's why we require, you know, manufacturer to provide how long your uh, calibration interval will last for the given accuracy, for the given kind of uh, precisions. So my, I'm glad to know you can make it. That's, that's, that's very important. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll send you some of our test procedure and, and, and a description of the data. data. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so well, I want to go back to you. Sorry, Vicky, let me interrupt a minute. Hi, um, Susan. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, hello, uh, Professor Yuan Ting Zhang. So for those of you who don't know, Professor Yuan Ting Zhang is actually an um, uh, expert and a pioneer in non-invasive uh, blood pressure uh, sensing, and he has been uh, working with NIH to um, push for the uh, clearance for uh, non-invasive blood pressure tracking uh, using uh, things like pulse wave velocity. So um, currently, uh, this is still not an NIH cleared approach, um, but hopefully with uh, uh, Professor John's efforts and uh, uh, all of our contributions, and uh, we can work together to make it uh, happen. Great. Thank you, Anshu. Thank you very much. Yes. We need to work together. Together, It's not an easy job. So uh, the standard actually is at the stage of uh, revision. And currently we are discussing for continued BP. What I announced is just for snapshot. I think this is the right time to do these continuous things with uh, Professor Huang's work. So let me go back to the general discussion and, and Glossio has a comment. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Vicky. Uh, there is a paper uh, that was published on June 23rd at the PNAS that uh, was very inspirational to me. And uh, I asked uh, all my students uh, to read the paper and uh, was brought to my attention by one of my students. And uh, I felt that uh, this uh, relates to our discussion here and that this can be very helpful to everyone, especially the ones that are uh, listening uh, to this discussion. The title is Mentorship and uh, Protege Success in STEM Fields. And uh, it starts with a fascinating discussion uh, in 1921 by uh, Thomas Edison and uh, Albert Einstein. And uh, their views uh, were quite different. Uh, Thomas Edison believed that uh, mentors impart to students the subject matter essential facts and formulas in aid of preparing students to be on the leading edge. On the other hand, uh, Einstein countered that uh, mentors should promote new thinking in students. The value of an education, Einstein concluded, is not the learning of uh, many facts, but uh, the training of uh, the mind to think something that cannot be learned from any textbook. And uh, it has uh, three interesting conclusions. I will just mention them very quickly. Uh, first, Mentorship strongly predicts protege success. Second, mentorship is significantly associated with an increase in uh, probability of proteges pioneering their own research topics. And uh, finally, contrary to conventional thought, proteges do not succeed most by following their mentors' research topics, but by studying original topics and co-authoring no more than a small fraction of papers with their mentors. I felt that this paper can be very nice to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. PNAS, uh, which year? PNAS uh, published uh, June 23rd, 2020, just a few days ago. Oh, OK. All right. Volume uh, 117, number 25. Thank you. June 23rd. <laughs> Thank you. So Jigong had uh, solicited some advice or some input on the future of EML seminars. Yep. Um, do you have any input for him? Yeah, we'll have a number of speakers and future speakers and discussion leaders here. And also audience. Any? So. Um, I Oh, go on. Oh, just a quick one. So Chikan last uh, uh, week, actually, um, uh, we discussed about the uh, um, table of content, right? It's not possible to have like all the uh, transcripts for every sentence, but just for the uh, uh, EML paper, uh, it's a short one, right? Maybe we can add a uh, table of content uh, for like, uh, different parts. Oh, good idea. 
Yeah, because people's talk usually are divided into different sections, right? So yeah. we just have to uh, uh, label the uh, time stamp for those uh, different sections. I think that's uh, already a big uh, help. Thank you. Shigan, do you have any, um, do you, do you, do you um, have any mechanisms for students or younger, for trainees, postdocs to uh, suggest speakers, suggest topics? Uh, right now, uh, there is no specific mechanism. Occasionally, I ask questions when uh, I send email around, and the people occasionally give me our input. The way we do this, uh, EML editors, we do this. We maintain a long list of potential speakers. Anybody get any recommendation, we put into the list, and then each week. Uh, we discuss our, what to do. So, I, so I mean, there is a, we're learning. We don't really know what to do. This is a falling on our lap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a fantastic forum. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I would just, I would just make a plug for um, that one way of increasing the diversity of talks, the yeah. diversity of topics, and the yeah. diversity of people would be to open up suggestions to a wider audience. Um, yeah. I think if you solicit only from people that are in a close or small community, you, you, you may not get the diversity of, of topics or, or speakers or, or, or even regions that you may want. Yeah. Um, I know the way we reach out is the following. This is also the new problem. We didn't have this problem before. How do you let people know you have the seminar? How do you ask people for input? But right now we have the following thing. We have a, a WeChat, about a thousand people are, uh, we call them friends of EML. Mm -hmm. That was established over the years. So that's uh, uh, mainly through to China. On United States, they're a little unfortunate because United States academics don't use social media. So we try to push this on, um, on uh, uh, Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are you on Twitter? You're not. Right. Yeah. Why well, don't Twitter? So well, Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. This, yeah. is, this is crazy. We ask, um, we ask um, uh, Elsevier, can you please send email to? You have a vast email list, right? Can you send email to to people on your list? They said no, because uh, they they push back to any because any email sent out by Elsevier is all automatically catalog as junk mail. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So you know what I do? I collect my email, just, just, uh, just an email over for, for, from my, my own sources. So it's an, I try to be as broad as, uh, as I can. That's, that's all I can do. This is a new question now. How, how, how do we let people know? We, on these uh, things in China, United States, uh, social media, and here uh, on email, we uh, ask for people for suggestions. My own view are, is this uh, uh, is um, because we can only do one uh, uh, speaker per week. So if we assume we're going to do this uh, one year, two years, maybe or indefinite. So over long enough time, we will have all these videos. So it's almost like you publish a paper at the end after one year or two, only a few papers or few videos are worth watching, right? Most are, right, for individuals are not really worthwhile. So it's very difficult to target individual, but if we consistently do good job, we will have the field, the entire field covered. Then after a year or two, oh, certain topic, I want to watch Vicky. Another topic, I want to watch uh, Glossio. So people have, I guess we only we can only have a long view. Right now, our, we can only do one speaker a week. That's our limit. That's a very good question. We try our best. I, I don't know. You ask the right question. This is the mechanism we have. Is there a way of, of, of maybe using Google Docs or Google surveys to, to reach a broader um, iMechanica audience? Surely there's a, iMechanica has a large email list. 
or we don't send email out to a mechanica. This is one thing turn we probably should do to have an eye mechanical discussion to ask for input, speakers, topics, and also mechanisms, what to do. Yeah, it's a, we, we, we have a master post in eye mechanica uh, archiving all the uh, uh, existing past uh, EML webinars and the upcoming ones and uh, linking to all those uh, different ones. And uh, you know the uh, the uh, uh, discussion part uh, below that is wide open. Everyone can leave a comment there and <laughs> make suggestions. It's actually a very open system. But uh, yeah, we need to find a way to encourage people to uh, share the uh, thoughts and uh, suggestions. And uh, also another way we can probably can leverage is the professional. Uh, societies, if I'm not, I'm not a Mr. King, we have the clean the president and the one, two, three, former president of SES Society of Engineering Science here. <laughs> when I was hosting the uh, uh, SES uh, meeting four or five years ago, there are 800 attendees. There must be a large database over there can uh, you can reach out and to spread the word as well. Um, you can help out. That would be great. <laughs> we, we, we can certainly do that. Um, you know, at, at, um, so we can we can definitely talk about um, how to use um, the, the, the mailing list for for various societies or SES in particular to do that. I would be, um, you know, we do send a lot of e we are currently sending quite a few emails because of the churn in in um, in activity yeah. the pandemic, so it, that would be yeah, that would be great. As well, also I, mentioned that that you you shared this uh, main point of that peanuts paper, the mentoring is so important. But you can, as many of us, you can regard this CML webinar as a way to really uh, 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 increase the impact or influence of your mentoring. So. Our videos uh, over the time can be viewed thousands of times by people, especially younger people around the world. So any mentoring advice you provided here, uh, you shared it with the, a certain advice you, you previously gave your student, now it's like increased a thousand, a few thousand times. So that's another motivation. Or, right, you just, uh, if you have advice, either topic, people, speakers, uh, please just shoot us emails. Or we, we do get emails, but whenever we do, we, we cannot react to everyone immediately. We, we just put uh, names, topics are on, on file and each week we'll discuss. So I'm sure over, over time, over a year or two, we will cover all the topic, important topics. I, I, I'm pretty op optimistic. Yeah, let's. Gaosho, uh, um, you have uh, any suggestion? I, no, not a suggestion, but a comment. Uh, maybe comments. Uh, I think the EML uh, webinars are uh, great. Uh, there are several uh, young faculty and uh, students that uh, have made comments to me uh, about uh, the value of uh, the EML and especially the discussions. Yeah. Uh, people appreciate it a lot. Uh, the, uh, for example, uh, be because of my participation, uh, something also that I learned that is new, uh, surprising to me, I have gotten uh, many emails based on the Q&A. Uh, and uh, that, that is something uh, quite interesting. Uh, I, I think you guys uh, are doing a, a wonderful job. Uh, I think uh, EML has established a leadership uh, in this uh, venue, in, in this idea, and uh, the way that uh, you are doing uh, this, I think, uh, has a, a very broad uh, outreach, uh, much beyond, as uh, Tang said, 
uh, much beyond the moment uh, that we spend here uh, during the during the seminars. So uh, I I think it looks great. The the only uh, comment, uh, let's say, that uh, I had uh, that is a little bit of a problem. Some people have uh, complained to me that uh, they feel sometimes that it's too long, uh, but maybe uh, the the timing is something that uh, probably uh, may need to be addressed. But uh, the way I see it uh, is a balance. Uh, there are two sides, as a Tang said. Uh, for example, if we are very strict with the time, probably this discussion and uh, the previous discussions uh, we had that were quite informative and exciting, that would not happen, right, Tang? That would not happen. So then that's a decision that uh, needs to be made. But this is great. Thank you. Um, I have a I have a comment or maybe suggestion. I think uh, Vicky raised a good point of involving uh, younger uh, folks in the in the field. Um, well, I, I see the the list right, the list of speakers, distinguished and uh, but quite senior speakers, right? That's great, right? Providing an overview of the field and also state of the art. But how to involve uh, more a younger fac more younger uh, generations like uh, postdocs? senior PhDs or even assistant professors. One uh, model maybe you can take a look is a uh, uh, Gordon Research Conference. Well, a few re refer this to virtual Gordon Conference, right? Because for Gordon Conference, now, in addition to Gordon Conference, they have something called a Gordon uh, Research Seminar, which essentially is just before that, for two days, they have a forum for uh, more of a younger uh, researchers. Okay, so they, ha they also have, yeah, they call the Golden Research Seminars. They give, I think the format is quite similar, but uh, the Golden Research Conference is more of a invited, more distinguished, but this is a more of a junior, fa junior faculties or younger generations. Maybe something to, uh, to, to, to Thank you, Yuan, uh, you uh, bring this up. There's actually several students uh, and a young postdoc organize uh, something, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, send it out, uh, has been going on for several weeks, uh, precise that idea, uh, precisely modeled after pre-conference, uh, golden conference, pre-conference, uh, several young people started. They just invited uh, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and uh, uh, occasionally, assistant professors. Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, that's great, that's great. Maybe yeah. somebody can formalize it, maybe also merge it as a part of this email, email, uh, email, email, yeah. email uh, uh, webinar series. Yeah. Great. Okay. Vicky, you have anything else you want to cover? No, I think we've we've uh, had a wonderful discussion today. Thank you, everybody, who uh, for for contributing and for a lively discussion. Um, thank you, Yang Yang, for thank a you. wonderful talk. Thank you, Vicky, for being a great host. Yeah. Yang so Yang, you just break the record in time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. For all those who are in attendance, who are younger trainees and students, I I would encourage you in the future when you attend. Don't be afraid to ask questions, speak up, you know, even if it's, especially if the questions are, uh, don't worry if they're not technical, you know, don't worry about asking a silly question. Every one of us remember when we were trainees and, uh, and we value your input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank have you. a good afternoon. Have a good night. Have a good morning, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.